<laughs> cool. Well, Carl, man, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to um, to getting to know you. Why don't you um, Why don't you just give me kind of a rough overview? Who are you? I, I understand you're an ex pastor. Is that right? Yeah, ex pastor. Um, started pastoring at a very young age, 26. I was okay. ordained in ministry at 21. I grew up in church. Started preaching at 13, and you know, wow. was on this what I thought was this roller coaster rocket to you know mega church status one day. Right. Um, seemingly every word that I received from 13 on indicated that that's exactly what was going to happen. Uh, none of it happened. And that's not why I'm no longer a pastor. Sure. Um, but, you know, that's kind of where I, where, I, where I started, where I began. And, and even though I had a I always have I always had a heart for people. But I never wanted to be a pastor. They, it was nowhere in my projection mm. of desire, nowhere in my hopes or dreams. I, I never looked at a pastor and fantasized that I was the one standing up there. Never, never, never. I did it because, again, I'd been told repeatedly that God wants to use you. He has a call in your life, yada, yada, yada. And I was also told that if you don't do what God wants you to do, he'll force you to do it. And you don't want that. So yeah. no one wants that, right? <laughs> So when that call came that, you know, the pastor told me the church I grew up in, he told me, he called me one day, said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to be going, I'm going to go ahead and complete my move to South Carolina and I'm going to install you as a pastor. I mean, I felt like I couldn't say anything, but okay. And sure. I did. Wow. What were you and doing then at that, that point? Um, <clears throat> I was at that point, I was working for bank. Okay. Um, and, you know, my, my goal in life was to pursue business, to, you know, own a business, to climb a corporate ladder, to become incredibly successful, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur or as sure. a corporate climber. So that, that was my passion, my dream, my goal. Wow. Um, so you got ripped I, right out of that almost. I got like, ripped really? right out of that. You know, you know, unfortunately, because of how I grew up in the, the domination I grew up in and in the doctrination I grew up under, they really made it seem like those things were not possible, were not good, were was not part of God's plan. You do what God wants mm. you to do, and hey, life be damned. Whatever that comes out of that, just you know, kind of live it. Sure. Um, I was told that you know, when I was in ministry, I'd gotten ordained. I was in ministry, and um, but I was working at this point in a retail environment, so you know, it required nights and weekends. And I'd miss a lot of Sunday service and, and Wednesday night and Friday night services. And people would come up to, would come up to me and tell me, hey, you know, God wants you to leave that job. God can't use you as long as you're on that job. And I mm. didn't know. I'm 22 years old, right? Um, and I did. I, I quit. I had nothing lined up. Wow. I just quit. I felt I was doing God's will. And I descended into a hell the first time I went to hell. <laughs> 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 You know, this is a good story when it's like the first time I went to hell. <laughs> yeah. you know. uh, it, it, it was a little hell. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I, I thought God was going to come to my rescue. I thought God was going to say, look at my boy. He's he's made this sacrifice for me. Mm. Now I'm going to come and rescue him and I'm going to show him, you know, how much I appreciate what he did. That didn't happen. Um, and then when I woke up out of that little craze. I went back to work, which is now this time I'm in the, I'm in banking and that's when the call to become pastor comes in. And, and I muddled through my career just slightly. And I was really trying to focus more on ministry. And I just felt this urge or this, not even an urge, but I felt this call. I felt because I've been programmed to believe pastors need to be full time. You don't need to be on that job. And we, you know, and we, we have a 50 member church. 50 members. Where, where I'm going? <laughs> you know, and these are members telling me this stuff. And I'm looking around. I'm not even taking a salary or anything from the church at this point. Yeah, well. And I'm like, you know, and everything is trust God, just trust God, just trust God, just trust God. So I did and went to hell the second time. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Jeez. Um, and um, then I went, uh, you know, I, I woke up out of that funk, went back to work. Became incredibly successful for the first time in my life. I was working in the mortgage industry now, and things were really moving really wonderfully. I, I finally felt like I was arriving. I mm. kind of really put pastoring on the on the side. I, I you know I became focused on work, and I went to church on Sunday and did my pastorly duties. That's how I saw it. Um, and then 2008 hit. The financial crisis hit. I dived and tanked with it, and 
again, though, that old indoctrinated program rose up again and said, mm. this is the time you need to trust God more than ever. You need to give God all your faith this time. Those last two times, you didn't give them all. all. <laughs> you didn't give me your all. And so I said, okay, I remember looking, I looked in the mirror and I said, okay, God, okay, God, I failed you twice at this thing, trusting you for my provisions and taking care of me. I'm going to do it this time. And not, not only that, God, I'm going to become a tither in this drastic drought season. Mm. And I went to hell for the third time. <laughs> but this time <laughs> I stayed in hell a long time. Wow. Um, Cause I, by this point I, I, I dove into the word of faith as well. Um, where the word can do it, the word will fix it, the word will change it, the word will prosper you, trust the word, trust the word, sow your seed, sow your seed. And uh, I stayed there way too long, wow. uh, you know, because I'd put all of my hope, all of my confidence, all of my faith into, but God said, he's going to supply my needs according to his riches, glory by Christ Jesus, and I'm going to stand on this word until it happens. I'm not moving. Mm. Uh, and Thanks be unto God, I woke up out of that and realized that, you know, through it all, um, I was pursuing someone else's uh, idea. Right. I was pursuing someone else's journey. I was pursuing someone else's um, interpretation for my life. And, um, you know, this I didn't quit pastoring because of that other circumstances led to that. But by this point, I was no longer pastoring. And I realized that the call, if there is a call, the call of God, I think that was on my life and on everyone's life is just go live, do life, have fun, enjoy it, know that you're loved. And that's it. You know? Mm. Um, and once I realized that, and uh, things really started to fall into place as far as the deconstruction process really sure. took a hold at that point and really started to help me challenge all of that indoctrination. Sure. Um, what caused that shift? So what, what caused you to go from like hardcore word of faith, like for an extended period of time, you're saying, you know, so for 2008, you were in the midst of that world, uh, word of faith, everything crashes, but you stayed in that word of faith through that, yeah. you know, it wasn't like yeah. the, the, the great recession caused you to like suddenly change. It wasn't that, it wasn't the right. suffering of like, oh crap, all the finances are gone, my work, my my business, right. mortgages and stuff, that's all gone. Because you still were like, okay, no, I can, if I tithe, I just right. double down. So you keep going. What caused you to suddenly go, dude, this is not what life's about. Life is about, you know, learning to love myself, learning to love others, learning to enjoy yes. the very fabric of life itself. Like that seems like a drastic shift um, yeah. to go on internally. Um, especially yeah. when you're so indoctrinated to like, just like you're saying, you're just living out someone else's idea of what life should be to suddenly kind yeah. of wake up to go, no, but what do I want life to be? That's a radical right. shift. Is there like, um, is there a point of a fulcrum point where you're like, Oh, everything kind of shifted on that, on that dime, or was it quite a, a long, just drawn out kind of like gradual change for you? Yeah, it was a journey. It was a, it was a long drawn out, uh, you know, portion of life for me. It actually started 2007, and I had a, a moment of a slight metamorphosis. I realized that what I was doing up until that point wasn't working, so I needed to find what worked. And I thought what, what, what the answer was was the word, because what I heard was you have to find the right seed for the need that came out of me. I heard it strong within me. So at that point, because I knew nothing else to be a seed other than the word, so I thought, okay, I got to dive into the word, which kind of led me to the word of faith movement right um but 2009 i heard something else and it said son you have no idea how big my grace is mm. and that was exactly true because for me uh, all i knew really about grace was by grace we're saved you know by faith we're saved by grace we're saved through faith and my grace is sufficient for you that's all i knew about grace and the, my grace is sufficient for you. That only meant to me because the only way I'd ever heard it preached and the only way I ever taught it was no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it is, no matter what you're suffering through, God will sprinkle you with a little bit of grace so you can carry on through that pain and carry on through that tr uh, mm -hmm. trouble and uh, you'd be happy because of it. That's all I knew grace to be. So when I heard, son, you have no idea how big my grace is, I said, show me. 
And then that's when it really starts to wow. unfold and unplug. And I would hear things just like you find the right seed for the need, just like some you have no idea how big my grace. I would hear things inside of me that would challenge and be totally contrary to everything I had thought I believed inside. Um, but I had made a decision, you know, little by little as that was happening, I made a decision because what I was hearing on the inside, bro, was bringing me great peace. Mm. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd hear something um, and it bring, it'll break something off of me, so to speak. And I'd, I'd come into this new found peace, this, this, this rest. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to keep doing that because I like the way this feels. And again, yeah, this is this okay. is a, a, someone who's coming from a lifetime at this point of working, striving, doing, praying, fasting, studying, just pouring mm. everything they have into it because this is what I was taught. God needs your time. God needs more of you. God wants more of you. God, you mm. know, if you want God to use, you've got to give him your all and give him everything and things like that. So this was my programming. Um so that, that's kind of how it started. And then 2010 and 2011, more and more truth started coming out and coming out. And um, I think, well, the way I like to describe it is like this. Um, once I started getting a better understanding of the revelation of grace, one day grace introduced me to unconditional love. So grace said, come here, I want to introduce you to someone. And grace introduced me to unconditional love. And then as I went further down the road with Grace and unconditional love. I'm in the middle. They took me down a little bit further and said, now I want to introduce you to oneness. Mm. And when that happened, whatever was left from the religiosity, from the indoctrination, from the, the do to be mindset, whatever was left, when I sure. met oneness, it was, it was like, okay. Sure. Talk to me. <laughs> okay. What do you mean by that? So what do you mean by oneness? You're talking <laughs> oneness with the God, the divine, or oneness with other people? Like, what does that mean? Or, or are you talking singularity, oneness is in, <laughs> oneness, it just is everything. There's a whole spectrum of ways people could engage with that language. Because I know some yeah. really religious people that might even use that language um, yeah. and mean something very different from how I would maybe use that language. And so um, <laughs> what, what was that for you? When you, you're saying, so unconditional love, that, that verbiage kind of makes set the same sense to most people. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, whether we like it or not. Um, hopefully most people like that. Um, but then yeah. you're saying like oneness was a step beyond unconditional love. So what was what was that for you? What was that? What did that look like? Yeah. You know, when unconditional love started to reveal itself and it, it first revealed itself to me, this person who strongly believe that your work and your performance indicated how much you loved God. So, you know, if you're serving, if you're working, if you love me, keep my commandments, that whole thing, that was an indication. And we were always taught to strive to love God more, love God better and things like that. Well, as unconditional love began to reveal itself from within me, the very first thing it did was show me how I'm seen, how I'm known, how I'm loved by this love. Mm. And that it required nothing from me. It never required anything from me. It didn't even matter if I loved it back. It was just revealing to me how I was viewed, loved, uh, accepted mm. into this love and had always been. So when I started understanding that, then it helped me take off my the lens of a Pharisee, the judgmental us versus them, I'm saved, mm. you're going to hell, um, I'm good, you're rotten, that, that those lenses that I've worn practically all my Christian life, sure. it helped me take those off and see people loved in the same way I love, I'm loved. You know, I live in an urban environment, so, you know, you see alcoholics on the corners and drug addicts and prostitutes and, and people that would be considered unsavory and with unsavory mm -hmm. lifestyles, let me say it that way. And I'd walk down the street, drive down the street in this city so often and look at them with great disgust. Just, mm -hmm. disgust. Well, I'm a pastor, right? I'm, a, I'm, I'm supposed to be the one here sharing love and, and all that stuff. And, and, and I would feel this disgust. I'd drive down the street, see a gang of young boys 
pants sagging and just, oh, you guys are just, you know, ugh, I would feel great disgust towards them. Um, but as unconditional love began to reveal to me what it is, what it does, what it looks mm. like, what it feels like, not just for me, but for everyone. And grace had already done a great work in me as far as understanding, well, if I'm graced, then I need to learn how to extend the same grace to others. Mm. And um, that really, that really changed the whole ball game. That, that, that was a huge shift for me in my thinking and my understanding and my way that I would walk out of the house now and see others. So as that began to really cement itself within me, as it began, it, it, it became my, my doctrine, my, my theology it became uh, everything that I wanted to talk about. And the only thing I really wanted mm. to talk about is this universal love, this unconditional love, this power that is so strong, so unique, doesn't care what you think about it, what you feel about it. It's going to do what it does regardless towards you. Um, and then that's when the oneness aspect, which, which for me means that I was one with that love. Mm. I'm one with that power. I'm one with that source. And then that helped me understand that I never lacked anything. Mm. I was never in need of anything. That the, the, the essence of who we really are, spirit, inside of us, our being, is all things. Mm. I don't, there's nothing I don't know. There's nothing I can't do. There, there's nothing I can't be. There's this essence, this power, this, this, this divineness that I really am. And I've been programmed to look at things through my sensory experiences and judge everything through my sensory experiences, mm. which were always all wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? it's um, such a it's such a contrary um, uh, dynamic to how church and religion operates, though. In general, I mean, I, yeah. I say church loosely and broadly, but um, sure. but I think generally speaking, religion needs a a ladder to climb. It needs sure. um, yeah. some distance to traverse. It needs some right. uh, separation to make you know. Sure. make one again like but that even even in the context of oneness in that religion it's, it's got to be tied to this 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 is right um right and and so it's just such a, a fundamental shift that you've gone to like it's such a, a drastic shift it's it's, drastic, it's, yeah. it's it's night and day really um yeah. as as you're going through that like you talk about you know this internal stuff of like just being oh this is good this is feels right it feels good like yeah. Was that at war with with? I mean, how, I mean, you're you're talking in doctrine because I, I understand because I come from the same sort of backgrounds uh, to some degree or another. We obviously the spectrum, <coughs> but like this is this is uh, hardcore indoctrination from an early age of yeah. this is what <coughs> truth is. This is even how you understand. Even whatever, uh, even if this person comes out and shows you something is true, if you look at this Bible page and it says something different, you, you don't actually have to believe all these things that you can touch and feel and read. Right. Um, right. You know, so it's, it's, it's like, it's such a level of like, this is the way it works. God isn't, you know, so right. unconditional. He, he actually made me, you need to do this and this and this. And if you don't do that, and if you are a, a, a prostitute on the street corner, if you are, you know, selling drugs, if you're buying the drugs, even if you, you know, we don't care about the yeah. backstory of anyone. Um, it's just this one isolated thing we can point to. Go, oh, that—that's obviously. Mm, ooh, yeah. um, you know, so you've got such a level of um, <clears throat> just just an entire framework that is built the way that you can perceive the world, and at the same time, you've got happening within this thing of like, whoa, this could be different, and I like that idea. Yeah, did that cause yeah. some um, dissonance within you? Some 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 internal sort of like struggles because i i can imagine for me that <laughs> sounds like an internal struggle issue for me um <laughs> I, I i i'm a bit weird i do i do enjoy that journey but it's still you know it's like oh wow well, wow well, is that right can i can i go there um so yeah. what, what was that what was that like for you navigating that that kind of process of like going into something that was so freeing but having been brought up in such a rigid kind of unfree movement even even that even the language and going this is what freedom looks like so yeah. even even going oh i feel so free and it's like well actually i don't because freedom looks like all these boundaries and rules and right yeah. you know it's just yeah. it's such a surreal yeah. kind of dynamic to kind of process and, and work through yeah yeah you know i <clears throat> again i grew up in an environment where rules and regulations 
patterned, structured, and determined who we were in, mm. in, in our church life, in our Christian life. Um, I grew up in an environment where my high school years were not enjoyed because everything was of the devil. You know, I, and I love my mother and she did the best she could. She, she, she was only working with the information she had. But I remember her asking me because I wanted to go to my prom. She said, okay, son, you go to your prom, but what would you do if Jesus comes back and you're on the dance floor? And with great shame and guilt, or guilt actually, and, and mm. fear, I decided not to go to my prom because I just didn't know what would happen if Jesus came back and I was dancing while he came back. <laughs> you know, so I grew up in that. Um, and I tried to stay very close to that type of living, the rules and regulations following the best. Kind of, I mean, of course, I wasn't perfect at it, but I tried my best because I thought that that's what God wanted. So as as these layers begin to peel back and these these what I thought were foundational truths begin to be challenged, <clears throat> I remember thinking so often. This is wrong. Mm. This is this is all wrong. This can't be. But I would feel great peace inside. Um, I'm going to be in a conference coming up in a few months, an uh, online conference with a few other people that kind of came through a you know deconstruction to re reconstruction mm. process. Um, and I don't know if I can say it's here, but I, I hope I have. The you say anything say here, so <laughs> okay. Um, and, and so, you know, we have to all kind of come up with a title and a subject of what we want to mm. talk about. And the first thing that hit me, the, the best way I can describe my journey was I was scared as shit, but I had peace inside. Mm. And, if, you know, if that makes any sense. That's exactly how it was. I was so incredibly scared. Is what I'm hearing truth? But inside, whenever I just got out of my mind and went inside, I just felt so good. You know, mm. I just felt at peace and at rest. And I remember one, one particular moment, this really kind of sealed it for me moving forward. Once this happened, it was pretty much a done deal moving forward. I was laying across my bed one day. And again, I had been taught and had been drilled in me. You have to pray a lot. You, you have to seek God a lot. You're a pastor. This is what you do. If you want God to bless you, anoint you, all this stuff. And I'm laying across my bed <clears throat> and I'm feeling the condemnation that I had felt practically this whole entire journey of not doing enough. And I thought it was from God. I thought God was saying, son, I mean, you're blowing it again, kid. I mean, mm. you've got this time on your hands and you're not using it to its full advantage. And I'm laying across my bed and I'm dejected as I've been so, so many times before. And I'm starting to trail off into this depression that I'd always felt over this matter. You know, God, I'm sorry, I'm not doing enough. And I, I keep trying and I'm, I'm, I'm replaying in my mind all of the times I've set standards. Okay, I'm gonna get up at six o'clock. Okay, I'm gonna get up at five o'clock. Okay, I'm gonna, before I leave the house, okay, as soon as I come home, I mean, I set up all these moments of how I'm gonna do this, how I'm gonna complete this given time to God task. Mm. And I'm laying across the bed and I'm, I'm like, God, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't do it. I, I, I guess I'm just gonna fail you again, let you down again. I'm sorry, but I'll keep trying. I'll keep trying my best. And I heard, when are you gonna trust? what I've already placed inside of you. Mm. And in the, in the stillest of moments, I just said, what? And it replayed inside of me again. When are you gonna trust what I've already placed inside of you? Now, instinctively, whenever I hear something like that, definitively, instinctively, I know exactly what it's saying. I just know, like, it's just like, you know, the cobwebs move away, the light comes on, whatever. I just know. And I mm. knew what it was saying. And at that moment, every bit of condemnation I ever felt up to that point completely left. Guilt, shame, disappointment, it all left. And I I was laying on my stomach at the time. And I rolled over on my back. <laughs> like this. Crossed my legs. And I just sat there in this um, abundance of peace that I'd never felt wow. before with this matter. And I made up my mind that day right there. 
If I never pray again, read again, pick up my Bible again, I already have enough to do whatever it is that I, I'm supposed to do for God. Mm. And that was the, the, probably the, one of the biggest breakthroughs in the journey for me. Yeah, yeah. How do you, so, I mean, what fascinates me about this is, um, you know, you're, the language you use in there is like you heard from God, whatever that looks like, um, this, this kind of like impartation of like, look, you've got it in you, it's good, and you just like, <clears throat> freedom boom. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, wow, yeah. like I could experience this peace and, um, and it sets you free in a whole new fresh way. But if we're going to be black and white and, and, and a bit uh, honest, that doesn't happen for a yeah. huge quantity of people, right? I mean, how many people uh, had you done life with day in, day out, you know, that had lived their whole lives without having God go, dude, you've got it in you. You want to try and change it up a bit, you know, like that, that yeah. doesn't happen. And so what do you, what do you think that is that, um, that, because <laughs> because i'm fascinated by that dynamic of of we could, we've all experienced certain things i don't want to say we've all but many of us have experienced certain things i know i've experienced certain things where i'm like whoa that's something beyond i don't know what that is or what language you want to use it and you can question that for the rest of your life and you might evolve and what labels you put on it as you go but i know <laughs> that wasn't me um and i know that the fruit of that was incredible um and yet i've come across people that don't have those moments that don't have those experiences and how do you, how do you think, how do you think, or how do you go about being, being someone that brings freedom to that person? Because, because to me, like, you know, I, I'm thinking through your story, and I'm like, that's intense, man. That's going to take, you know, you take a step out, you talk to someone that's like religious trauma syndrome expert or something like that, you know, and, and the psychologist is going to go, dude, that guy's got some shit. We're going to have, yeah, give me three <laughs> or four years, and we can get we can get started on this, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're like looking at it from the outside, going, dude, we got some work going on, and then you have a moment on a bed, and they're like, really. Dude, that's like you know three years worth of therapy I just lost there. I could have made a, a buck out of this guy, Kyle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but but a lot of people don't have those those moments, you know, for for whatever reason. We could probably, I mean, that's just in the realm of metaphysics and explaining away why God acts, why God doesn't. But taking that off the table because I think that's just a whole trail we could go down for hours and not really get anywhere. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming since no one's figured that in the last two thousand years, we're probably not going to figure it out on a podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> How do you, how do you think we best go about helping people that are in that place of such kind of like, I, from my perspective, where I see it, I think it's it, in some ways it's very essential for people's psychological growth to go through those structured elements and things like that. But on another level, there's there's degrees to which that can go so far. I would say it's quite traumatic and, and potentially abusive. And you know, hearing some of the things that have happened to you, I'm like, no, that's just abuse. Like you know, that's 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 not okay. Um, right. So people going through that level of trauma, trying to help them move on, evolve, grow, develop, that's, that's, that's a lot of work. You know, how, how do you, because I, I, knowing the little I do know about you, I know that's part of your heart is helping people kind of come out of those kind of ways of thinking to come into a place of maybe where you're at right now. Um, yeah. What do you think is the right ways to, to start that ball rolling for people? How do you think we can best engage with people that are in that place? Well, I, you know, number one, I don't think that there's a one way. Mm. Um, you know, we're we're all individuals, and we're all going to see things, hear things, feel things, you know, contemplate things differently. Um, I was raised in an environment where, you know, to my mom's credit, she would make us get on our knees and wait there till God spoke to us. Mm. You know, and although as a kid I didn't really know what that was like or what it felt like or sounded like, but you know, I, I try to stay there as long as I can and, you know, try to listen. And most of my teenage years into my young adult life, it was really the same thing. But I, we had this constant drilling of you, you sit there before God, or they would say lay there before God, which meant get on your knees. You lay there before God and you don't say anything until God speaks. Mm. Um, and I would hear other people talk about this. Oh, you know, I, I, this week I made up my mind, I'm going to do that. And the first day, nothing. The second day I fell asleep, the third day, nothing. And then all of a sudden on the fourth day, I heard God speak. Oh my God, it was incredible. Mm. And you hear these things. Um, so I think for me, my subconscious programming, uh, was, was set in place to that degree where I felt like I could hear from God. I had to go through a process to become familiar with that voice. And then whenever I did, it would just kind of 
happen organically from that point. Sure. Um, now, of course, everyone won't have that subconscious programming installed in them, you know, like I did. Other people, yeah, you know, will, will, will discover it in different ways. But see, because, you know, we say God is omnipresent, right? We, we, we throw out these churchy words, omnipresent, omnipotent, omni this, omni that, you know. But yet, the church will scare the hell out of you to even consider God being anything less than their pastor in their church on Sunday morning at the altar. Like, this is the only place you can find God. Come down here to this altar, get your touch, and go back and try it again. Um, <clears throat> but yet we say God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God is in everything. And I think when people are willing to just get still enough, and I think stillness, whether, you know, we call it meditation or just silent computation, whatever it is, when we're willing to do that, we're willing to just get still, to get silent. There is no one, I believe, in this world that has lived, that will ever live, that doesn't already have spirit living inside of them. We're spirit beings. Mm. So uh, it's, it's for me and, and for so many people that I hear talk about this. It's in those still moments. And I think one of the one of the most powerful, if not key scriptures to life, if we want to use a scripture here, is Psalms 4610. Be still and know. Mm. Now you can leave the rest of that out. The rest of that is, you know, not not important to 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 you know kind of what what I'm talking about right now, but that be still and know. Because what it tells me is in stillness. You're going to get to know something that you've already always have known. Mm. You just haven't heard it before or you haven't felt it before. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a that's a that's something I always try to encourage people to people have actually that all my life. You know, they hear me preaching or teaching. And, they, and I say, I heard God say, I heard God say, you know, and they'll come after the preaching or teaching and say, I've never heard God speak to me. Mm. And I'll say often that's impossible. God is always talking. We're probably just not hearing. And I would say then, you know, because you're not prayed up enough. You're not fasting enough, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> but, we're, you know, I do believe God is always speaking because God is everywhere in everything, you know. Mm. And I think that every person who has ever walked this religious pathway, this religious journey, this religious, I think every one of us is filled with great conflict. Because as you mentioned earlier, Phil, you know, our religious structures are designed to keep us separated, designed to keep us distant, designed to keep us in a place of having to do more mm -hmm. to get something from God. They're designed to work that way. It's good for business. It's good for repeat business. Yeah. It, it won't work if we, from a religious perspective, fully empower people from day one that you have everything, you lack nothing, you need nothing. It, that that yeah. model doesn't work for the religious structure called the church, Christianity, whatever you want to call it. It just doesn't work because you know, if you don't need me, then, you know. You're, you're getting rid of the middleman, right? It's the middleman coming yeah. in and going, hey, you can buy straight from there and it's about 10% right. cheaper. I'll see right. you next week. And you're like, no, you won't see me ever again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so do you think and, a and lot I, of it is our, our verbiage of, of uh, when we talk about, so, cause I, I agree. I, I think there is something within us, you know, when we, when we experience something of life, you know, you, yeah. you watch a cheesy YouTuber Facebook clip or something. And it's about a, a guy who forgives his daughter's murderer yeah, or something. And right? you watch it and you're like that. That's what it's all about. There's, there's something about, uh, inside me. There's something tuned to go, even though society tells me, no, that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is watching that guy be punished and suffer and whatever. But there's something deeper that we all kind of can connect with on some level going, oh, that is it. Or you, I don't know, even just, you know, you sit around with your friends over dinner and you're laughing right. and you're having a great time. And you turn to your friend and just go, this is what it's all about. This is, yeah. this is what life's yeah. about. You know, there's something that knows there's something deeper, but I do wonder if in, in a sense, actually it's our language. Um, it's our, maybe our, our language around God actually limits how we can engage with God or recognize yeah. God. 
Sure. Um, you know, I just had a Facebook post last week um, I posted about is God a he because so many people get so obsessed right, with right, this. Right. It's like, oh yeah. yeah, absolutely. And is God tall? And uh, how much does God weigh? <laughs> you know, it's like, this is, we're, we're talking about something that's a very physical um, concept, a he, right? I mean, right. Uh, male, female, you know, like but that's a very physical thing. Um, yeah. And then you're talking about something that is beyond that, that made those things, you know, it's like, right, right, right. It's, it's like, you know, my brain looking at numbers and going, oh, what number is my brain? Like, right. what, what does that mean? I, you just, well, um, you know, what, how, does, how does blue feel? Like, right. I don't know. It's a color. It doesn't feel anything, yeah. you know? Is, is a tree sad? I don't think so. Um, you know, but this is the kind of concept. So it, but, but the way our language, so as soon as we call God a he, we've immediately gone, oh, it can't sound like a she, or it can't look right. like a she, or it right. can't look like right. a mom. It's got to look like a dad, and then whatever. Right. And, and I think right. to some degree, um, so I agree with what you're saying, that we all have access to this thing of, of mm-hmm. an internal compass, a uh, connection right. with with this thing that is beyond all, but within all and, and runs through yeah. all. Um, but I think sometimes our language as Christians holds us back yeah. from seeing that because it's not Absolutely. the old guy with the beard that exactly. we do need to go through a pastor or through a church. Or, exactly. um, so do you think there's an element of, uh, of finding language that society connects with or finding a way to deprogram um maybe christians could, who have that limitation i think maybe society <clears throat> is more open to it in a sense maybe yeah. because they don't have that programming um, does that sound right am i kind of like yeah yeah it, it absolutely sounds right you know i heard someone say this and it makes sense we in christian faith or you know whatever you want to call it we love the he language of god because it's laced all through the bible mm-hmm. now if that's the reason why we do it and the reason why we have it, then one should consider, well, if, if these chauvinistic um, type writers who predominantly all male, I mean, I don't even mm-hmm. know who wrote Esther. No one tells us that. Right. So, um, <clears throat> you know, these writers who, again, had a very chauvinistic viewpoint, women are, you know, subjugated to meaningless and, you know, we are the only ones that know anything. So they projected their chauvinistic viewpoint onto God as a he, and it was predominant, mm. just he, 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 he. And so if that language was different, like if we wrote, if, if we edited, rewrote, revised the Bible today, how would it sound, right? Mm. It would have words in there like consciousness, right? Uh, it'd have words in there like she, and and she moved upon, and, and he moved upon, and they moved upon, or it moved upon. And, and I have these these languages and these words that actually make sense to the larger portion of humanity. Mm. So, and, 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 and to the Christian who's been programmed with the he language, it's very challenging to get out of that he language, even though I totally believe God, you know, God is neither he or she, or whatever. I like to say it more than people say, you can't say it about God. <laughs> It does. It feels impersonal in a sense as well, though. And I think when you've had that level of um, personal connection to this divine being on some level, right. you, it feels because so, I struggle. One of the things I struggle, I was talking to my wife the other day. I was in the garden and we trying to come up with like a, an amazing, profound quote of some sort. And I was like, "Do you know what? You immediately lose so much profundity when you like sound grammatically weird." Um, so, like, do you know what I mean you can come up with a really profound little s- sentence, and you're like, "Oh, that's good," but then you're like, "Okay, but I've said he." Right. And so if I change or himself or something, if I change that to Mm -hmm. itself or they, or I'm like, I now just sound like an idiot. Like, (laughs) it's like, and I'm like, okay, so I'm going for grammatically correct or kind of more politically, I don't know what the right Right. word, but I'm like, damn it. Why am I forced into this weird (laughs) dynamic of trying to choose how to come across? But you're so right, because at the end of the day, like my language around this is, is, it's a limitation. It's not... And it's, yeah. and it's a limitation of how we can see God. It's not a limitation of right. who God is. Like, right. Um, right. It does feel like people are fighting for that. <laughs> you know? Oh, I, yeah. I, I got so much people, so many people yelling at me. Yeah, well, I bet Jesus had a penis. And I'm like, probably, probably so. You know, we, I don't know. I mean, I'm not there, like, you know, looking up the robe. But um, I'm assuming that Jesus was male or 
a very large outlying. He was probably maybe intersex, <laughs> but had external yeah. male genitalia, maybe. Yeah. Um, but there's probably yeah. a significant chance he wasn't a female. Yes, you are correct. Wonderful. Awesome. What's your point? Like, what, yeah, what's the exactly. actual point here? Are you saying that the creator of the universe, before he created, like, a universe, before he created atoms, before helium and hydrogen existed, he made sure, but I definitely have a penis, right? I definitely <laughs> am male. I definitely have this many chromosomes. My hormones are like, before he made helium, he had hormones, you know? Right. It's, like, um, it's, it's, such a, it's such a ludicrous fight, and yet it's so deeply ingrained in us to have these kind of, like, no, but God has to be like this, and and my religion has to work this way. Um, right. it's, it's serious deprogramming to to yeah. work through, and I don't it say is. that to mock anyone in a sense. I think it is funny and it is silly, and you know yeah. when you can see it from a different perspective. It's, it's the same as um, you might laugh at a small child. You don't think they're stupid; they just don't know any better than the world, you know. And so, like, they make these right. wild sayings or things or. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's in some ways, and I've, I'm just being really offensive calling people that think God is a he, like he's a small child. Or, but I just think it's, it's just a different way of looking at things. And until you step out of that, you can't see right. differently, you know? Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And so my challenge is then, so then if I'm going to help this person, do I write he rather than it? Do I just, do I just go, oh, well, it doesn't really matter to me. And it doesn't, right. certainly doesn't matter to God. Because like right. God's gonna right. cry over it. Oh no, right. Phil oh used God. the wrong words. <laughs> um, so, but it does matter to this person. And if that's yeah. not the hill I'm fighting for right now, if I'm trying to help this person see that God's better, or God's more gracious, or God's more loving, oh, you can keep you, you can keep the God with the penis and the beard. That if that's really important, sure. so you can hold on to that for a little while longer. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'm then well, uh, am I actually? furthering the problem right am i actually still feeding the the, the beast um yeah do, do you do you wrestle with stuff like that in your interaction sure. you, you, you interact Absolutely. um very publicly online yeah. you, you share different things do you think yeah. about things like that or how am i wording this and all the time how does that yeah 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 I, I wrote a post maybe about six months ago and i said okay heads up everyone um i'm gonna start using she and it as I relate to God sometimes. So sometimes you'll see a post that'll say she and it and things like that. And that was my intention to bring, at least try to bring some femininity into the character and nature of God, to, to get people out of this mindset that God is the man sitting on the throne with a beard and he has all these manly, hardcore, I'm a man, I have no emotions, no feelings, no thoughts, towards those kind of things. Get that imagery away from people and help soften the look of God, so to speak, with some mm. feminine characteristics, some motherly characteristics, things that, my God, we need our women, we need our mother, we need these parts to, to function, you know, in a good way. Mm. I, I need a woman to come and tell me, Kyle, you need to, you know, you need to think about this. And she gives me a, a sensitivity uh, or, or a viewpoint that's more sensitive, that more, that's more gentle, that's more loving, you know. My father was hardcore. My mother was gentle and sweet. So we we glean from mom when necessary and glean from dad when necessary mm. together. You know, we became hopefully better people. So I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then my heart intention was to start doing that more. Just saying instead of he specifically using she entirely in a, in a post. Mm. But I didn't get there. <laughs> you know, I didn't really do it. Not because I, I got a lot of kickback from the post but just again the programming is just yeah. so deep and when you write it just flows out that way and you think i did say i'm going to start using these other words more ah next post <laughs> you know? yeah yeah yeah. no i find that I, even I, I was writing um i can't remember what i was writing probably just like a post for something or whatever but i was writing and i just noticed even things like when i'm using examples of people so i'll be like oh mm -hmm. the theologian he and i'm like yeah. whoa, whoa whoa stop phil stop 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 why is the theologian a he? Now, of course, why is, why is it a she? Why is it he? Like, it, it, it's a hypothetical made-up theologian in my head. But why do I default to being a he? And I do notice this. I, I notice this. Like, I, look, I look at my books and I read through them and I'm like, oh, my God, they're all male. Like, all these theologians are male. Like, where are the freaking female <laughs> theologians? You quickly check online and you're like, oh, there's loads of them. I'm just not reading sure. them. Uh, and sure. so it, it, it's, I, I wonder what is, is it the chicken to the egg kind of thing as well? You know, so I'm like, uh <laughs> I can say what I like, but at some point I'm going to have to break into the cycle. Um, yeah. 
And, and I do think about that as well, of like how much that feeds the way we see things. And, and so I think, it's, like you're saying, it's just really hard to break that cycle because every book we pick up says he. Every yeah. time we yeah. pray to God, thinking about God, and when we like close our eyes and we're sitting there on our knees waiting to hear from God, right? We were expecting the guy with yeah. the beards and he's right. old and he's sitting on a big throne. That was who was going to speak to us. It wasn't like, um, you know, Saharu from the shack, you know, right. being in and going, hey, how's it going? You know, that wasn't yeah. what we were expecting to hear from. And so yeah. we've got these ingrained um things so i think you've got to have a bit of grace for yourself of course yeah but i yeah. really struggle with it i, I really am challenged and yeah. i get a lot of messages from people going hey uh, I, i'm like you know i'm transgender or i'm uh, i'm female yeah. um do you have any idea how hard it is for me to consistently i genuinely appreciate you and what you're doing but i really do feel like you're very much skewed towards this this yeah. uh, perspective um, and it's it's a tough one to break those kind of um, those models of reframing what God can look like. Um, yeah. Absolutely huge. Um, it is. It's very difficult to do it. You know, the, you brought up the shack, and mm -hmm. as amazing, most people who who watched it would probably admit or agree that the movie and the book was amazing. It did mm -hmm. something for them. It healed something in them. It it revealed something about um, you know, them or, or God mm. that they hadn't noticed before, realized before that was there. But yet you had a, a good portion of the evangelical church deciding to boycott, criticize, mm -hmm. stare people away from this movie because they chose to depict God as a black woman. Mm-hmm. And the outrage from Christians because of such was incredible. Yeah. I mean, as if, as if the possibility is so outrageous, it would cause anger for people. Mm -hmm. Like, why would that be? If we really believe that God is in everyone or God created everyone or we all look like God in some kind of way. Why would that enrage you? Why would it bother you? I mean, could you imagine, like you're saying to the to the to the transgender community, these beautiful, lovely people who are perfectly the way they are and just living life in the in the freedom and peace that they finally come to? I mean, if if we started considering or or writing or suggesting that God is really Transgender, he created him and them and female and you know, that whole thing. If we suggested that, that God is okay with this, people get outraged mm -hmm, because it doesn't would. fit within the small little box that we created and we slapped God in eons ago. And I hope that changes because mm. until for me, when I was ready to see the world inclusively, not in any way excluded from this universal love, this universal consciousness. When I began to see the world as one, and again, oneness to me represented my oneness with this divine consciousness, with, with this divine being, with this source, um, but also my oneness with humanity. Mm. Uh, you know, I like to think of it this way, perhaps. God is this huge rock, this huge structure of some kind, and it, it explodes. And every bit of that explosion is God itself. Mm. You know, you and I are that particle that exploded from this God. And if we all came back, if, 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 if God called all these particles back to reform or reshape mm -hmm. this Thing before it exploded, it'd be all of us. We'd all be like, you know, it was those cartoons and movies where things are going back and like reconnecting the Voltron thing or whatever. <laughs> We'd all be going back to that. So you are God. I am God. This person, that person, as they are. And that's so difficult to understand. And it's mm. very difficult to embrace, especially for those of us that have been programmed with an us versus them mentality. We're here. You're not. We're good. You're not. 
we're saved, you're unsaved, we're believers, you're unbelievers. And all of that language was man-made language, just mm -hmm. simply designed to put in systematic control over people and systematic segregation over people. That's just wording we created. You're a believer, I'm an unbeliever. You're saved, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saved. We, we created all that nonsense. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's done tremendous harm to humanity as a whole. God doesn't look at anybody like a sinner or, or unsinner or saved or unsaved. He doesn't look at anybody as a believer or unbeliever. He doesn't look at anybody as, you know, um, good or bad. He, that's, just, that's just too limiting for God. God looks at him and says, oh, yeah, you're mine. <laughs> and boy, if I tell you what, I love everything about you. And that's that's difficult to embrace. Yeah. We, we've eaten from the tree of knowledge and good and evil for so long. We've been programmed with, by this tree, and this tree has taken over our logic, taken over our common sense, taken over everything about us. And yet this tree of life has been here all the time. We've never been restricted from it because we've always been life. And what would happen if we leave this tree and just eat from this tree and just started seeing everything as life? Oh, my mm. goodness. You want to talk about this whole ball game changing? It would all change if we just yeah. saw everything as life. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I love that. That's a beautiful example of the rock exploding. Because, I mean, in a sense, what happened, if you can trace everyone back, you go keep going back to like 13 point whatever, 8 million, billion years or whatever, you've got the singularity, which is what they think is, just this right. dot, this whatever. And, and it's hard to imagine, but like it's smaller than we can kind of <laughs> grasp. And yet in it is you and me right. and Earth right. and Uranus and another <laughs> galaxy. 800 million light years away you know it's it's all just in this tiny little dot and in that dot is the the iphone and you know and <laughs> yeah. but in that dot is um colonization and yeah. uh slavery and racism and murder and hate but also mm -hmm. uh, you know love and and yeah. and freedom and peace and and you know inclusion and and it's right. all just in that dot initially uh, mm -hmm. it, everything that has ever existed as a concept, as a reality, as an experience, as a molecule, as an atom was just there at the beginning and just went, Phew. and if you grabbed it all and pulled it all back, we'd be back there in that, that, that thing. It, it's, it's a mind blowing kind of like concept. I think is. that we're all part of this somehow interconnected thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Fascinating. And then you start looking at quantum, you know, mechanics is quite, right. it, it just it breaks your head when you start to see, <laughs> yeah. oh gosh, we are all interlinked. We are all interconnected. Yeah. And, 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 you know, science is going, oh, we'll figure this out at some point, but by God, we definitely don't know what to do yet. We have right. no idea what the hell's going on. Um, yeah. it's, it's fascinating to see. I want to go back to the shack just because you mentioned there, I just think it's so interesting um, just to see people's reactions to that. It, I, I do wonder if, is it, do you think it's since is do you think it represents the systemic issue of of religion and Christianity of that you've got a structure that puts it, the way that this religion has been built has been built by powerful men basically thousands of years ago there was no other kind of powerful sure. people so the men were in power and they built a religion which then right. in turn means that men are, are in power have it mm -hmm. and yep. as a whole when we look at you know America we look at Europe. On the whole, we're still talking powerful white men on the whole. Sure. Um, sure. And, and so, yeah, I, I know that there's, there's thriving black churches, there's thriving interracial and, and, and mixed churches, absolutely. But on the whole, mm -hmm. this whole system, if it's going to be represented, yeah. is generally by right. an old white guy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. do you think that that's part of the pushback of when we look at something <clears throat> like the shack, it exposes this whole system has been built to say, right. well, God should look like this person. Right, yeah, <laughs> who just yeah. happens to be the person laying out this rule, right? The person that's laying out the rule goes, when you think of God, I want you to look at me and go, right. gosh, he looks a lot like God. He's old, he's got a beard, he's like male. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think I'm just fascinated by that dynamic of how systemic it is for us mm -hmm. to engage with God uh, as the people that are in power in our very real tangible lives, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're not that different. And actually the challenges to that are, are hugely resisted, whether it's actually very much challenges in like, oh, we'd like this person to be empowering government or in business or whatever. Yeah. We, we feel the same pushback to some degree. Um, yeah. But it's so much bigger when you say, oh, no, no, but God is a man. 
God is white or what it's yeah. fascinating to me that concept you, you you can even go into a black church and and the picture of God depicted on the window yeah. is still white you know yeah. and you're like whoa yeah. there's an amazing yeah. I can't remember who did it but there's an amazing series put together of um of pictures of um uh non-white uh depictions of God and Jesus and Mother Mary and all these and they're stunning mm. there's different um sculptures and paintings and stained glass windows that they found around the world is absolutely <coughs> stunning but there's no way you can cut it they're rare <laughs> she, yeah. this, woman, Very, this, yeah. this woman that went and found them had to work hard to find them yeah. I was like, she was yeah. just, i'll go into the next three churches and i'm sure there'll be a black god somewhere you know <laughs> <laughs> it's just i mean we joke about you know like the the philippines uh, jesus you've seen the pictures yeah. of that guy it's like like i've got like a 58 pack or something you're like Jesus, yeah. wow, nice jesus <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it looks like you'd nail the nail into him and the nail would bend you know I mean, right like, yeah. um, but but they are rare these depictions of, of gods that are um and, and that's fascinating because you look at certain cultures you can go into a culture um a tribal culture and generally the god that they have will look something like them yeah but when you look at yeah. this 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 uh religion that is christianity Mm -hmm. for a good portion of the world the god looks nothing like them mm -hmm. um, and it looks no. like they're oppressors now yeah i don't want to make this a yeah. huge uh thing but i think it is a huge it uh, is. race issue and and it's a it huge um patriarchal issue as well like, there's no yeah. doubt about it um, yeah yeah i don't know do you have thoughts on 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 those elements of of how church is quite systemically yeah. patriarchal racist you know yeah. whatever you know we could go we could give them a lot of ists really i'm yeah. sure um and i don't yeah. want to and the thing is i don't want to pretend i'm not a part of that because the thing is right. i am systemically racist i am systemically patriarchal i've been brought up in that world as well and i've benefited from it and i've also mm -hmm. um uh, been blind to it and i still am blind to many elements of it so i'm not saying this is in like look at the church over there look at those races. Right, right. i'm like no, no look at me as well um but yeah. do you have thoughts on like those dynamics yeah, you know, you're absolutely right, Phil. It is very systemic. Um, what happens is I think a lot of people don't really understand how this Christian thing really got started. You know, we, we want to point back to Jesus and these 12. We want to say, ah, you know, Jesus and the 12, and the 12 took it and began to spread it across the world. And, you know, we, we, get, we create this image that, Wherever they went, as they spread the gospel of love and inclusion and hope and peace and joy, people would flock to this newfound truth and they would all oh, fall in love with it and they would embrace it and, and Christianity just spread around the world with such harmony and peace and love and tranquility. That's how we mm -hmm. preach it and that's how I've preached it and taught it. And it was fascinating to me when I had that singular mindset about it. And then you open up some history books. And dangerous, you, uh, dangerous. <laughs> those, those are satanic, uh, uh, secularized, yeah. <laughs> evil, evil, terrible people. They, they yeah. no, no. You know, you, 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 you venture outside the Bible some and you start learning about people like Constantine, who at the first time I heard about what he, what he did, oh, wow, he made a decree that everyone has to be a Christian. Oh, this is incredible. This is wonderful. This is great. You know, mm. I remember my huge first victory initial, for Christianity. Right. You know, like, yay, go, go Christians. Um, and that was my first initial thought. And I even bring them up in my messages. Sometimes the great Constantines, you know, had a conversion and, and just, you know, but then you read a couple other history books and then you start to think now you're not programmed anymore religiously. Now you're not indoctrinated anymore. And you start reading, you start thinking, you start learning and discovering some new things. And you realize, oh, wait a minute. Well, was that really a, a, a love thing to Constantine? Mm. Was that really a, a I want to see people blessed, healed, set free, deliver, you know, the whole Christian thing that we like to talk about so much? Or was it really one of the the biggest power grabs probably ever happened in, mm. in, in society. And I'm going to use this to control a people with hope. I'm going to use this to control people. I'm really going to, you know, my, my, my tactics are really going to be fear-based and my motive is really going to be fear-based and control motivated, but I'm going to use the theory of hope to do it. And, you know, I, I don't believe that Constantine's, 
desire for the world to be Christian was sincere. I think he saw it as something he can use to his advantage mm -hmm. to, to control and draw people in. Let's take this movement. Let's take this momentum and use it to our advantage. The, still to this day, the, 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 the most powerful religious entity is the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, mm -hmm. what else can you say about that? And I'm not, you know, knocking them. So out of that, you're absolutely right. We, we get this, <clears throat> this look. And this look is determined to be what it's going to be. And the writings are going to be determined. This is what it's going to be. And everything was determined by powerful people with an agenda that was not Christ-like, I believe. That was not love-motivated, I believe. That was not people-oriented, I believe. Mm. It was not motivated towards people. It was not directed towards people. It was control and power. Now, did Christianity, some, some pure elements of Christianity spread about? Sure. But was it the overall reason why Christianity spread? No. Mm. Because if it were, then people would have people could not have stood behind the Bible and Christianity to commit the atrocities that they did if it was a pure, sincere movement. Mm. You know, um, historically speaking, when the, the, you know, the Europeans came here and they wanted America. They wanted what was in America. There were people here and, you know, they, they rightfully owned what was here, whatever, wherever they were, they owned it. It was theirs. Yeah. And they had to create a reason to eliminate these people, to vilify these people. So they labeled them savages mm. and they went to their pastors of these local colonies and they said we need your help you know we need to we need to find you know a biblical reason why these savages can be persecuted put to death driven out so on and so forth and they create this narrative and pastors and churches in the bible got behind it and said yes these savages they're going to rape and kill your women they're going to you know you know destroy your white pure blood and all this other kind of stuff and they use that like they use it for slavery, like they use it for other genocidal acts. They just used it for their advantage. Mm. And a lot of people haven't even considered this possibility. Now, I'm not vilifying all of Christianity, but again, that, 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 that element yeah. where that systematic control, that, that, that one singular type, you know, the white men in power. Um, and not, not, when I say white man, I don't mean it like, you know, simply, oh, the white man will get you. The white man's the devil. I don't mean it that way. But, you know, the, the, the image that you illustrated, that you pointed out, that the, this is the way it looks. You know, if, 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 if Christianity is going to be true to its origin, to its what people think the origin is, Jesus spreading love, including all. If, mm. if Christianity is going to be true to that, then we need an Indian God. Mm -hmm. We need a black God. We need a white God. We need a Chinese God, an Asian God. We need a Hispanic God. We need a, you know, Az Aztecian God. I mean, we need a God that represents every single culture and yeah. race and being. We need a God that's that's a woman, a transgender, a gay, a straight. I mean, we need a God that looks like everything. And the, the systematic, systemic um, power structure that is, ain't going for that at all <laughs> no no yeah you're right i, I mean i it's, it seems so obvious to me but i can also look at myself with a bit of um a bit of distance and and look at my past with a bit of a safe right. space as well that i don't feel i'm attacking myself too much and i can go hey, look at idiot phil back then 10 years ago let's not do me that too. two weeks, I no, let's not do it two weeks ago because i'll be a bit too touchy <laughs> uh, but you know i can look at myself and go yeah okay uh, to, so to me, it feels obvious now that I look at Jesus says, look, you loved God when you loved the least. Right. So you loved the, the homeless or the, the immigrant or whoever was the least in that culture. He points to, you know, these right. these people that are widows or whatever. We don't look at widows these days and go, look at a widow, stupid widow. 
right? Yeah. Like that's not, so it's probably not the best example. It's maybe a great example of someone vulnerable, maybe perhaps, but again, in right. this culture, probably not. She'll probably get some sort of government benefits if there's no family to cover, you know? So again, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not the best, <clears throat> the best examples of, of who we look at as the least of us in this culture. Mm-hmm. Um, it is the, oh, look at that transgender person that we're all pressing. Um, yeah. look at that, uh, or you go back and look at, you know, go to the, not long ago at all, and we go, oh yeah, no, homosexuals, you know, like, you know, the LGBTQ community, super oppressed, you know, I mean, like, yeah. really, like, I mean, getting lynched, and things like yeah. that, uh, or I, again, I guilty. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, and, and absolutely, I grew up in, in the background of, like, no, gay people are, they're, they're not bad people, but they're evil, you know, and that was, that was the yeah. kind of concept of, like, or sure. there's this evil streak running through them that's possessed yeah. them, or, you know, whatever the language was, um, and so I, 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 I don't, I'm not, uh, but but to me, it seems now coming out of that, it seems fairly obvious to me of going, oh, well, if Jesus is saying whoever the least of those people is, that's God. It does say to me that I look at that person, whoever the least of these is now to me, whatever it is, if it's a yeah. particular race, which is sexuality, if it's a, right. it, it might be someone that votes differently than me, or, you know, maybe it's someone right. in the church rather than outside the church, you know, whatever my biases are that I go, look at this idiot or, you know, like whatever, um, right. or well, they don't deserve whatever <clears throat> they should be on. They're on the outs, you know, maybe it's the exclusive people. I'm so inclusive that I ostracize the inclus- exclusive. And then suddenly I'm like, yeah. oh. but whatever that person is, that is God. Loving that person is how I love God. And so yeah. there is an exclusive uh, picture. Oh God, this is this this person that I see as yeah. exclusive person. I, I'm looking at a picture of God. Now, I'm not saying God is exclusive, but I'm saying that that person, yeah. if I love yeah. them, I'm loving God. If I right. say that, you know, and again, I'm not saying that God is male or female, but if I find right. the person and go, I'm loving this person, I am loving God. Um, and so for me, it seems insanity, like you're saying, of like, you know, like, why are we getting obsessed with the shack of like, you know, of course, we don't think God explicitly <laughs> looks like a tibia specter or, you know, whoever <laughs> the different characters are. Well, of course, that's not what God literally looks like. Right. Um, he, he transcends light and eyeballs. Right. I mean, right, so right. God, right. God doesn't quote unquote look like anything because he created the, ex- yeah. the existence <laughs> of being able to see something. <laughs> right. Um, right. But I'm trying to think where I was going with all that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it does feel like um, it's just so deeply ingrained in us to it make is. sure that God is on our side. He's in our yeah. team. And so, of course, yeah. powerful people that do have the opportunity. So Christianity, of course, I mean, to be honest with you, the, the primary reason the world is so much better than it is that it was 2000 years ago is probably largely to do with Jesus and his influence and his teachings. Yeah. Now, was some of that co-opted and became a part of empire building and structure and it's empire building sure. for the Roman empire. It's empire building for the British empire. It's empire building for the sure. Belgian. And now it's empire mm-hmm. building for American, right? You've got the mm-hmm. conflation of Jesus and Christianity. Sure. Yeah. Um, sure. Or sorry, Jesus <clears throat> and American Um I just yeah. had um, Kevin Miller on the, on the show. I don't know if you know of Kevin Miller. He, he just did a documentary called J E S U S A. Um, I've and heard it's, of it. it's about the conflation of Christianity and American um, and how yeah. you just don't know the difference at times. Um, yeah. And and yet, if you take a step out and you're a, a, a Somalian looking at uh, Americans and you're a Christian, you're looking at Americans and you go, a lot of that isn't Christian because I don't yeah. do that. You know, I don't go right. to church, you know, doing that um, or right. whatever. I, I don't. That's not the way I love my neighbor. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so this, it, it requires to take a step out to see it. And so I think that's what we're talking about here is we can take a step out and look at and go oh yeah. i can see some of these systems of yeah i think yeah. most people within probably it's very hard to see it is. how christianity has been co-opted in a sense yeah, um, yeah. that's not it, it, necessarily inherently see. obvious right right it's very hard to see and it sounds offensive to a lot of people and it sounds like an attack and i was there you know i, I used to watch mm. history i love history so i used to watch history channel a lot and you know a and e when they have these documentaries or they're you know, their, you know, Noah's Ark or something they would talk about biblically. And, and these theologians would come on and, and it would seem as if they were just dis- trying to disprove my biblical literalism. Mm, <laughs> you know? yeah. And I would get mad and, and I'd say, how can you be a theologian? You're supposed to be supporting what the Bible says. Why are you <laughs> raising questions? You know, mm. and I would get really angry until I realized all they were doing they were taking data, you know, real historical data and yep. saying, eh, this 
story <laughs> happened this way. And we've got this historical data that says this is more likely what happened. Eh, maybe we're looking at this wrong. Yeah. And I, I used to get so angry at the theologians on these shows for years. Yeah. Oh, me too. Liber liberal sellouts. You know I mean? They're just, they're yeah. just like, watering you know, down the word of God for their own benefit, yeah. for their own agenda, whatever that exactly. is. But, you know, I, I totally recognize yeah. that. And, and so, yeah. 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 And Sorry, keep going. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was very difficult to see it until I'd become uh, deprogrammed or, um, you know, I lost my indoctrination. I lost that that stronghold of, of literalism, of, you know, I've got it right. Everyone else has it wrong. Once mm. that started falling away, you know, you're starting to see things a lot differently. I, I tell people this, and I really believe it's all my heart. <clears throat> and as good as Christianity is and whatever it's done good and whatever, you know, the Islam faith has done that's good and, and, and the Buddhist faith, different Taoist and all these different faiths, whatever they've done that's good, I, I applaud all of them for the good in them <clears throat> and the good they do and the love they preach mm. and the, 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 the inclusion that they, they believe. And I, I applaud every form of faith that does that whatever it's called. But I don't believe anyone ever needed any allegiance to any faith whatsoever to be who we are and to be who we've always been. And I know our attachment to our faith makes us feel like we have something. It makes us, makes us feel like we're part of something. And I understand that. We love community. We love to feel like, yes, I'm in something. And mm -hmm. this something that I'm in matters. And I'm okay with that. But you didn't need it. It wasn't a necessity. Because again, if it is, then God would have to be Christian or mm -hmm. Buddhist or Islam or Muslim or a Taoist or a Hindu or whatever. God would have to be that if, if, if whatever God is whatever this consciousness is, it would have to be of one religious faith in order for any religious faith to be either valid or invalid. And I can't see that as being a possibility. So these religious organizations, these faiths, they're for us. We created them. We align ourselves to what we think fits us and we try to run with it. But if we leave it all, and we get to the core of us. The core of us is love. We are love beings. And if we all live from our core, and you go back to the words of Jesus, who had no religious affiliation whatsoever. He wasn't you know, part of Judaism. He wasn't starting Christianity. He was just someone who understood this tremendous love of the universe that he had become aware of and his place in connection with this extreme love. And he was just trying to get people to see themselves as loved as he realized he was and to see their value from a divinity perspective that you're one with this love, you're one with this God, mm -hmm. you're one with this consciousness, you're not excluded. So the message as you refer to when he's telling them to that person you vilify, that person you look over, that person you want to ostracize and segregate down to a low portion of humanity. Don't do that because that person is God. Mm -hmm. When Philip says, Jesus, show us the Father, Jesus says, Haven't I been have I been with you this long? You have not seen the Father. And, and I always thought he was talking about, well, because I'm God, you know, mm -hmm. you, sh you should know this. <clears throat> but what he was really saying was. You've seen love. And not only have you seen love, but you've seen a representation of what love is and what love does. And you, I think the story goes on, it's not written, but I think he says to them, and you, Philip, and you, Peter, and you, John, and, and the rest of you, you too are the very image of God. You are also the same. So when I look at you, when you're loving, when you're kind, when you're doing uh, from the, 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 when you're living from within the pure essence of who you are, I see God. And, you know, I think that's something that we as a whole have not yet embraced, but we're getting there, I think, because this consciousness yeah. is not necessarily grown because it's always been here, but our awareness to this consciousness is growing. And more yeah. and more of us are starting to see it for what it is and embrace it 
And it's really changed the spectrum of what we're seeing as we move forward. We're seeing things from a, a, a overall perspective of, wait a minute, this is really not so bad. This world is not so bad. People are not so bad. Situations are not so bad. There's so much more good in people, in us, in this world than all of the momentary, chaotic, uh, seemingly evil moments that are so highlighted. But at the end of the day, they really don't tell the story. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So talk to me about this. So, uh, something that absolutely fascinates me is consciousness as a whole. Like, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's the great problem, right? I mean, we, we, we just don't know. Um, so I'm going to ask you, what do you think? <laughs> Figure it out first, Kyle. Come on. Um, but, you know, how, how do you see this? Um, you know, do because we're talking about this um, this concept of consciousness that, that is within all humans and, and maybe in other uh, you know, creatures, whatever, we don't really know, but it's maybe right. highlights of potential forms of consciousness in certain animals and different things like that. But like, um, certainly within all humans, there's this thing of consciousness that is, is um, unknown. You know, you can talk to a very reductionist scientist and they'll just go, ah, oh, no, that's just the electrons fire in a certain way. And we paint this picture a certain way because we want to give it some sort of meaning to give ourselves a narrative to walk through. And that's what consciousness is. It's, it's this thing. And then you talk to someone that's Eastern and they've been meditating for three, 4,000 years, you know, like yeah. as a tradition. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, eh, no, you know, well, <laughs> you know, they've got right, a yeah. totally different concept of like, you know, well, who is the observer, you know, and who is observing the observer? <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah. it's like this endless, like kind of, like Russian doll scenario, you just keep taking them off. It's like, well, yeah, but who's looking at that? And um, yeah, but who's looking at that? And um, yeah. it's, it's this this depth, this this huge depth. That's why I love a lot of the Eastern uh, traditions. Is there's such yeah. depth in looking within and seeing yeah. something that is greater and bigger. Um, and and I I think that I I agree with you uh, fundamentally. I think that this this consciousness. I, I struggle to look at it in a reductionist sense. I struggle to look at it as just. Um, electrons firing, you know, I mean, I, I, it could be, maybe it could be, I, I'm not saying it's not. And I, and, and I think if we can prove that, which, and, and if that is what it is, we will at some point be able to prove that. So I, I wait to see the data, uh, but we've yeah. not got there yet. Um, and I, and I do think there is something deeper, you know, it's like what we're talking about, that underlying knowing you just kind of like, I just know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so we've got that going on. And yet there's an element of engaging with that, you know, so there is an element of the Eastern person going, I'm going to just sit and just observe and actually yeah. who is observing right now because i feel sad yeah. but who's noticing i feel sad and mm -hmm. therefore is am i sad or am i something that can observe this being sad and you know it's, it's just like all these different layers um yeah. and i think that on some level i i love the idea of this consciousness being um ultimately truly what is divinity what is god you know i i love uh, richard Rohr's the universal christ uh, i don't know if you've read yeah. that or come across yeah, yeah, it and, yeah so i think that's a yeah. beautiful picture of that if people haven't read that or, or or if you're not into reading go listen to his podcast I think it's called um another name for everything i think and he kind of talks about it but yeah. i love these concepts i love looking at it i love um andy weir's um the egg i don't know if you've watched that or read it no. it's fantastic i'll, I'll send you a link okay. after this so if, if you're Thank watching you. this type into google uh, type into youtube the egg and there's a great video demonstration of it but ultimately yeah. um that we are all part of this singular consciousness um yeah and that ultimately um all lives are ultimately the same being living yeah. in, in, in a fresh expression, fresh way, encountering and yeah. engaging through. So the idea that ultimately you and I are just a fresh and unique aspect or, or working of God, um, exploring and experiencing and living in this world. And yeah. yes, there's a me, but actually deeper than that, a whole other level, this is God, this is God. And I'm, yeah. I'm just in the image and likeness of God, a, a facet of it so i love all these kind of ideas but yeah i guess what I'm, I'm wanting to ask is this engagement with this consciousness you go back to the roman empire you go back to jesus's day and it doesn't feel like people were using that language right they were still in the no. he it, yeah. the guy with the beards where jesus where's <laughs> yeah. the guy with the beard man Elohim. Like, god have you not been like, have i been with you this long that you're still looking for a freaking guy with a beard right and, yeah yeah uh, like that always feels like the interaction of Jesus going, are you freaking kidding me? Um, yeah. <laughs> me. Um, yeah. But uh, 
so so it feels like we've in some ways um, evolved or or adapted and grown and developed as yeah. as a greater species as humans as a yeah. whole. And I know a lot yeah. of parts of the world are less. Um, open to these kind of concepts and ideas and some have been there for longer some are there shorter some are even remotely there you know um you go into the average evangelical church that we're talking about they're probably not up for this conversation um no. if, and I, I there's not one of them listening to us because they left the conversation a while back <laughs> sure <laughs> um, but um, well as soon as we said god is a she they were okay. that was it they were like and we're done <laughs> there we go delete that podcast um report this to youtube um, <laughs> but it feels like as a whole, as a, as a species, we are developing in a way that's allowing us to engage with that in a, a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, and do you have thoughts on what that looks like? Do you, do, you, do you think there's a specific reasoning behind why we're getting more into engaging with that than we have been in the past? Or Do you know what I'm saying? I just think this is such a yeah. fascinating concept. It, it sounds is. like you're really into the concept of consciousness. I'd love to <laughs> hear you flesh out what you think is going on and how we're engaging with it as a, as a people group today. Yeah. You know, I think one of the huge problems, especially in Christianity or, or any religion that takes its source from a book, is mm -hmm. that it, you know, it's very easy to read things from a literal view. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And because we look like we look, we think that this was the image and the likeness of God. You know, we've read the story literally. Uh, we think that there was an actual serpent in the tree talking to Eve. Mm. You know, we think there was a donkey that one day talked. I mean, we think these things are literal, yet after the book was closed or written, you see none of this ever again. Yeah. No. no, 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 not once, not twice. Dude, I don't know about you, Kyle. <laughs> I talk to donkeys every day. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, excuse me, then I, 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 I retract that and then, you know, go a different way. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's true. We, yeah, yeah. Right? We, we, we just take it literally and we, we look at these stories as with great wonderment, like, ooh, the power of God. He let that donkey talk. I mean, so, I think that's that's where we we struggle. We we struggle there because that's most of our beginnings. But what is really the image and likeness of God? Right? It can't be this. Mm. It, it can't be. It has to be something bigger. It has to be something that is actually always in operation in this invisible realm that our natural eyes can't peer into. You know, it's kind of like when we go to sleep. Many people believe that when we sleep, we have, you know, interdimensional travel. We we travel out of our bodies, our consciousness leaves, so to speak, and we travel off and we see other things and all these other kind of stuff. And I do believe that is very well possible. Mm. I mean, we're sleep, we're doing some, you know. Um, yeah, the, the brain is more active when you're asleep than when you're awake, right? Which always fascinates right. me. I'm like, it, exactly. <laughs> So, so there, there is this, 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 this humongous consciousness out there that is so full of everything. I, I, I like to think, you know, we, we have our historical aspect of humanity. And so, you know, you, you have this Neanderthal period of time where men walking around with a club and hitting the woman over the head and dragging her by the hair into the cave. Kind of thing. How far we've come, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> come, woman. You know, um, and we, you know, we we see that part, and we think, boy, these are some you know, really ignorant, you know, uneducated yeah. or, or un uninformed or whatever, unaware people. And then I think there's really nothing new. Mm. They could have been driving in cars. They could have built skyscrapers and. You know, they they could have this that that group of people and, and every group of per people that has lived before us, they could have had the very things that we're amazed by today. Mm. And I think humanity, as we continue to grow and evolve, and I don't think that this story of humanity ever ends. I don't mm. see a place where it ever ends. I think we just keep going. I don't know if we keep coming back. I like that option better than, you know, standing behind some pearly gates with a harp, walking streets of gold, you know, eyeballing someone else's mansion. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> I like the idea of, you know, what else is out there? What's next kind of mm. a thing. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I think that once we're willing to consider that this consciousness, this intelligence has always been here and we've always had access to it. I think what we're seeing is the more and more and more we're we're getting the information of its, I guess, reality of how it really works and how it really exists within us. Because think about it, Phil. If you sit down long enough and you get an idea, and if you sit down long enough with this idea, you'll start seeing other elements of this idea grow. Mm. And before long, if you work this or or sit with this idea long enough, you could create the next great big thing. Now, did this thing just happen because you were just creating it or was it always there? You just tuned into what's always been there. And I think that's what humanity is starting to catch a hold Mm. of now with the quantum physics and 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 understanding this this whole invisible realm through thought and feeling and emotion and frequency and vibration, we're starting to understand how everything exists in this invisible realm and how to bring these things into our natural realm and how to bypass our sensory experiences, which we've lived by for so long, which we've judged things by for so long. And we're understanding that there's something happening on a vibrational level on a frequency on an invisible level that is so much more powerful and fluid than anything we've experienced here in this natural realm and we're learning how to go and pull these things into Mm. our natural reality on a day-to-day basis because i can't see a scenario where this intelligence this consciousness says okay you're going to be the millionaire you're going to be the person born in somalia somalia you know in, in great poverty and hunger all of your, you know, I, I can't mm-hmm. see this intelligence doing it. I, I, I just, I, to me, that's cruel. If that's what you are, then you know what? I really don't want any part of you. But I do think that this intelligence says to this person who became this by taking the information, the downloads or whatever it is and using it to become, and this person in Somalia has the same ability. They're just unaware of it. They've, you know, again, unfortunately the the condition and where they are, perhaps they'll never see it that way, but that consciousness is growing around everyone and people are starting to see themselves as this potential and they start to see the potentiality of what they're capable of through thought, through imagination, through feeling. And these things are really starting to grow within us at least in our understanding, and it's really changing at a very rapid pace how we see the world, how we see ourselves. And I'm so curious as to how this all looks in the next 10 years, per se. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, even with and, myself. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it almost feels to me almost there's a chicken and egg dynamic of like, are we exploring and discovering uh, what consciousness is and and, and seeking right. it out, or almost is there an element of the consciousness? Is this, this universal intelligence? Is it almost actually eking us forward and going, hey, what, yeah. it, look at that, <laughs> right. and you, you yeah. explore this, and here you create that, and um, but one thing I, I I'm intrigued by because this is something that's been posed to me before, and and I actually I feel very challenged by it. Is do you do you think there's an element of this? Um, there's almost a level of a privileged elitism within this um, uh, place of of being uh, more uh, enlightened, uh, aware, whatever that language you talk about. This person in Somalia, or they could be anybody, could be in Asia, could be in the UK or whatever. But you, you've got a, you've got that background, and odds are you're just not gonna get to the point where you become aware of a greater consciousness and grow and develop. And, and it, it, it kind of harks us right back to this God that is going, oh, you get this and you get that. Right. It, it does right. feel that there's almost an element um, of, and, and part of me wonders if this is because of an over-anthropomorphization of 
consciousness we make it as a person that is going right. okay i'm the guy with the beard right. and uh you you don't get to have it <laughs> right and you do and right. actually there's an element we go back to calling god an it Are, is there an element of a, a less personalized divinity god mm-hmm. that it isn't sitting there going well what's the moral thing this thing should have a good life and this one should have a bad life and right. i don't really care we we moralize that but actually is it just a thing of like no, people are born all throughout the planet. That's where they're born because that's where they came and that's where their ancestors moved to. And that's just the way it is. And consciousness is this 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 thing, whatever, whatever yeah. God to consciousness, if we're gonna frame it in that for, for the sake of this conversation, it's 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 just going, well, you're born in that place, and I'm trying to move you, whatever that looks yeah. like. And you know what? Right. You live. 3000 years ago. And so I'm going to move you by like, you know, maybe just making you feel a little bit bad about how you treat those, you know, peasants uh, or the slaves you have or whatever. Um, And that's just a little nudge in the right direction. Whereas today it's like, oh, I'm going to make you, uh, you know, move in the right direction by going, hey, you should download this Headspace app and meditate for 15 minutes every day. You know, (laughs) it's ridiculous to kind of compare in a sense, but in another sense, it's, it's the different tools and the different things that are put in our Plate that move us forward so my question is uh, do you think that um do you think that this consciousness has a personality do you see god as 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 a personal being or do you see it as something a bit uh i don't want to say more or less because i i, I because i think yeah. even that dives into this we're again anthropomorphizing where we're moralizing something that is beyond maybe morals it's it's beyond the fruit of uh, the knowledge of good and evil right it's something bigger yeah. um so but for lack of words, do you see it as that, or do you see it as something um, slightly different? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Because I feel like there's a, yeah, a yeah, key yeah. problem of of uh, as soon as it's a, a personal thing, yeah. the morality and the ethics of a god that goes, ah, nope, sorry, you were born in Ethiopia in the '90s, no food for you because right. that country over there has completely victimized you and taken everything, or I've put a dictator in there and. Yeah, I put the dictator there. I mean, sorry. Right. Um, right. Do you, do you see that dynamic, and how do you wrestle with that component? Yeah, you know, I, I, grew, I grew up in an environment where God is in control, and you don't question that. You're taught not to question it. You're taught it can't be anything other than God being in control of everything. Our steps are ordered. Hmm. Um, but then I also grew up in the same environment where we were rather impoverished. We struggled financially. We never made it outside of, you know, just barely making it. But we believed God. We prayed to this God. We, we you know, we served this God. We worshiped this God. We gave this God our Sundays all day, our Saturdays, our, you know, our Monday, our Wednesdays and our Fridays. I mean, we, we poured all we had into believing mm. this God will make it better for us one day if we just keep trusting and believing and serving and doing. Well, that God never came to our rescue. That God, that version of what we believe God was, never came down and made it better for us, never came right. down and changed it, never came down and uh, made it um, easier. However, there was a man who was on television at the time his name was reverend ike and um you know i just remember hearing bits and pieces about him stay away from him he's a charlatan he'll steal your money and things like that and so you know you hear it from adults and you say oh you see him on tv you turn it real fast because you know that guy's a crook he's nasty he's, 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 you're a whatever. well-behaved kid i'd be like all right well, mom's out. get <laughs> get reverend ike on <laughs> <laughs> i was too afraid because the mom came home and saw us watching it you know that we got to deal with that that's so, funny um, but then this same, uh, person, Reverend Ike, I ran across one of his YouTube videos. Um, it was just in my suggestions. So I clicked it. I was curious. And he's talking about the law of attraction. He's talking about, um, you can create your world. You can create your wealth. You can create you can, like these things that are, you know, in the secret and other sources mm. that, that, you know, we've been taught to stay away from. But he's talking about that in the 70s. Wow. During the same time, our family was going through great trouble, great financial struggle through the 70s and 80s. He, he's talking about that then. And I called my friend. I said, hey, bro, you remember Reverend Ike? He said, yeah, man, I remember Reverend Ike. I said, 
I just watched a YouTube video because he and I were just starting to understand some of this stuff. Right. I said, he was talking about this stuff back then. Mm. Could you imagine what would have happened to these poor black people he was preaching to if they had embraced what he was saying rather than rejecting what he was saying and just started to learn how to manifest through thought and the law of attraction or whatever? Could you imagine what our lives would have transformed into? Mm. He was trying to help us, but we vilified him because we didn't understand his message. And I think that's what happens with this. I don't think God is in control. I don't think God has anything to do with, you know, the selection and the, the that whole, sorry, got to call me, with that whole thing. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's more simpler than that. It's information sitting in front of us that, again, because of indoctrination and programming, we've been taught to ignore it, to bypass it, to overlook it. And we can, we have that choice, right? And we'll go back like I did and say, God, when is it going to get better? God, when is it going to change? God, when are you going to help? And until you're ready to hear that the help is here within you, Mm. it's always been here. You lack nothing and you start understanding. Like for me, much of the spiritual stuff I grew up with and I preached and taught didn't make any sense to me. And it didn't start making sense to me until I started understanding quantum physics a little bit better. Mm. That's when this stuff started making sense. Wait a minute. I can really do all things? Not through this person I thought was living inside of me named Jesus who was, okay, you can have that. Okay, you can do that. Oh, nope, nope, can't do that. Can't be this. Uh Uh-uh, nope. But through this, this, this power that I've, I've always had, this ability to create, this ability to be, this ability to, to, to be unlimited information, as Dr. Joe Dispenza says, he says, you know, someone asked him, well, what do you do while you while you, you know, you're waiting for stuff to start to manifest? Let's keep getting more information. Mm-hmm. Keep learning. Because this, this, this intelligence is so vast. It's, it has a tremendous amount of you know, unlimited resource of information. And we got to keep getting more of it as we go down this journey. So as the person who became the billionaire, the billionaire, because God said, okay, I want you, Bill Gates, to be the billionaire. Or did Bill just tap into something that was inside of him? Mm. And he kept tapping and tapping and tapping and windows came to his intelligence and, and whatever, whatever. And he worked it and worked it and, He'd sit down and think about the next, how to change it, how to make it better. And, and it just, he just kept gaining from that, that intelligence because it was there and he tapped into it. And, you know, it just, you know, was that more likely what happened? Absolutely. So this person in, you know, this indigenous village that it's, you know, still practicing some of its traditional type um, rituals that we will look upon and say, Oh man, you're you're just you know you're just so far behind times. Some of these indigenous people in these in, indigenous places, they're so far ahead of us. They're healing cancer, not by these, not with any medicine. They're 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 transcending into these these mystical beings in their communities and doing some far out out of the body kind of stuff. Simply because they understand, they know, they just have the information on how to do it. You know that 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 that's you know some of these same indigenous people uh, uh, said, if you give me your child between one and seven, I'll, I'll pretty much give you the person that they're going to be for the rest of their life. And there's so much of that that we just don't understand. The you know the subconscious programming, the 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 you know. Uh, this whole thing that's working behind the scenes. And I think that has more to do with it than absolutely anything else. Mm. I could be wrong. (laughs) You know, maybe there is, you know, some element of God that is dictating and, 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 and kind of putting stuff in place. Okay. You're here, you're here, you're there, you're there. Maybe. And I could be wrong, but I like this version better. It gives me more peace. 
<laughs> do, do you think um, I'm intrigued because do you think that's um, that everything is tied into this, that everything is kind of incorporated in this? Because I look at someone like Bill Gates and know nothing to say about the guy at all. You know, I, I watched right. his uh, documentary on Netflix. It was good propaganda piece. So I, I mean, Bill Gates stopped funded a documentary i'm not surprised it made him out to be amazing right, right. he is an right. amazing guy I, I think he right. you know he probably is doing amazing things but i'm like i'm probably not going to get all my details from that and then i'm reading you right, know like right, right. the crazy people that are like oh bill gates is trying to kill everyone with vaccines or you know and misquoting yeah. him and like you know whatever and i'm like okay but you guys are also you've got an agenda so i'm like okay so i don't know bill gates so i don't know right i, I don't know right, right, right. but um uh, so I don't know if he's sitting there going like, oh, I'm just going to like tap into what's within and creativity or whatever. Um, but he he could also just be some guy that just benefited out of, uh, you know, yeah. the, who he knew or this or that. Or, you know, or you look at someone that became a, a billionaire because they stole someone's idea and they just happened to be uh, privileged enough that no one would question that guy. And the person that he stole yeah. from was not privileged enough that you know, no one's going to care or listen to him. Right. Um, you know, right. things like that happen as well. And so like, I think it's, it's intriguing to me, you know, um, I, I, I wonder how much of this is all ingrained in some undergirding consciousness that guides us all and is leading us all um, that we're either aware of or not aware of, but on some level benefiting from. Um, and, and, or, if it's just the way that life is, you know, it's, it's just, you know, this is, this is the way it is, you know? So um, I often think about this with something like capitalism is, is a great example of like, you know, like you go, wow, well, like Bill, like he's, he's amazing, successful. Bill Gates is a great example of capitalism because <laughs> he's, he's, you know, one of the richest people on the planet, he did it well. Um, but yeah. you know, he, he, he thinks like a capitalist, he thinks like that. He's, sure. he's an entrepreneur. He's a go-getter. He knows how to sell things. He knows how to build things that people want. And, you know, he knows how to crush his opponents. And, you know, I mean, the, right. the good bill that we have today is not the bill that we had throughout history. Bill was right, right, right. a pretty hated man for a lot of time. And sure you know, he, he was a pretty ruthless uh, business person. And so you look at all these different things. And again, it comes back to this moralizing of like, right. we can look at different elements and go, oh, that was good. And that was bad. Um, and yet just as much good helps people become successful. And again, that goes there to our capitalism of what is success, because I don't think the people in the indigenous rainforest are like looking to start the next Microsoft or, you know, or, right, right. Um, and, and, and in the same sense as well, they don't give a crap about people in, um, you right. know, Africa dying of, you know, malaria either, you know, right. so there's goods and bads to that. Right. I, I, yeah, so I'm not sure. saying that, you know, sure. we should, again, this moralizing of it. Um, right. But I, I wonder this whole concept of consciousness, um, leading people guiding people it still feels very um i'm trying to think what the right way to put it is i guess <laughs> it feels very much like certain people benefit from this more than others right so it's the person that listens yeah. to reverend dyke oh you're lucky you get to become the person that climbs out of your impoverished uh yeah. you know whatever situation because you listen to the right preacher on you know whatever channel and oh i'm sorry you listen to whoever i don't know right and you don't and that's the way right. it works and um yeah. and so it still boils down to this very um it, if it's this consciousness that's driving it um and it's yeah. not just the way the world is in a sense um right. there still seems to be this element of like well is this consciousness good is it bad yeah like what is, is it, it doing what is yeah. it what's its agenda what's its goal because i can right. hear like someone like richard right. Rohr talking about the christ consciousness well this consciousness is love it is inclusion it is all these things i don't see you know dos when bill gates pulls out dos and becomes a billionaire overnight yeah i don't see dos being a bastion of love and inclusion you know it's just a good software bit you know he wrote yeah. in the panic um <laughs> yeah and so i'm like so what what is this and how does it engage and how does it work because i can see it, it going wow that's beautiful because it caused some indigenous tribe to uh i don't know start licking a certain type of toads and cure cancer i don't know you know who yeah. knows what different <laughs> yeah. things are at it. Um, you know so that's that's awesome but again that's not necessarily love and inclusion if they're going right. if they if they go all right i've cured my wife of cancer by giving her this herbal remedy that like i just felt the divine leading me towards this right, is, why right. don't you mix this tree bark with this frog and 
rub it together, set it on fire, and then give it to your wife, and you'll be fine. And it like wonderful. <laughs> and then he turns around and stabs the neighbor from the you know the next right. tribe over who has a slightly different face paint and therefore is a threat to our group. Our group is threatened by it's yeah. it's it's. Uh, to me, I'm like, what's going on here? Like, what what, what is this? Yeah. Because I, I like the kind of painted picture of like kind of the Christ consciousness of Richard Rohr. But I feel like yeah. this generalized concept of like it's something that's leading all humanity into a certain... Because right. I don't see it necessarily as leading all humanity. Or is there an, a, an element where people are rejecting it? Can we say that people that are poor and dying and starving? Because it's maybe easy to look at like <clears throat> Joseph Coney, who's setting up, you know, child slave camps and mutilating people. Yeah. Okay, he's probably rejecting this consciousness of love right. and inclusion. But the person right. is just starving and, you know, and poor and, you know, has no prospects. Have they done anything to deserve that? Is there not? And if yeah. this consciousness is able to break in, why not this person? Um, yeah, you know, though, that's a that's where it gets really. I don't want to say murky, but it gets, you know, it leads you to more questions, mm. right? Uh, you know, it's almost in the same vein as the question: If God is love, then why so much bad, right? Yeah. Um, if God is in control, why didn't he stop this, or why did he allow this? And I, it, it's it's a very see for someone like me who has gone through a pretty wide range of understandings or beliefs about a god. You know, this starts off with this god being all powerful, in control of everything, forcing, making, doing. Every single thing, you know, he'll take a bad and turning into good and that kind of thing. Um, this God who sends you angels to guard over you, watch you. So you don't know if you really were going to get into an accident today because your angels protected you and you, you made it home safely. The angels did a good job. If you didn't make it home safely because the devil, yeah. you know, distracted the angel. And now, you know, you got to. <laughs> <laughs> you you masturbated this morning to porn. So God removed his protection. Yeah. The devil right. came in and you crashed that car. You know? It's like, <laughs> yeah, you're like you're right. So you're going through all these navigational uh, points, and then you get to a point that you know say, okay, well, I don't believe in a natural or you know a being, a entity a, called a devil that's up here, you know, on my right shoulder while the angel's over here, and I don't believe in that anymore. And then when I stop believing in that, then all of the demonic activity that I thought was happening in my life kind of disappeared. You know, mm. so warfare stopped and oppression stopped, and all this stuff that I thought I was attributing to this devil. All that went away. It's when I stopped believing in a, you know, an entity called a devil, a Lucifer that fell from heaven and was fighting God, you know, tooth and nail for everything. Uh, and and to now where I am, when I stopped believing that, you know, that Jesus per se, the the, well, the, the concept of Jesus in the way I was taught is the Lord of my life. Mm. When I stopped believing that. And I realized that I'm the Lord of my life in, a, in the same aspect that Jesus understood his oneness with father, you know, um, that when I think about every aspect of my life, the hell I was in, I put myself there. When I was experiencing moments of heaven, I put myself there. Um, the things that were considered ups and downs, I played a role in every up and every down. You know, to everyone I hurt, it was me. To everyone I helped, it was me. I mean, you know, so where I am today, you know, I, and again, it's it's so difficult talking about this on an overall scale because there's people who are hurting, right? Of course. And there's, there's people who have gone through tremendously terrible things and, and are still going through tremendously terrible things. There's parts of this world that the very glimpse of what they're going through tears you to pieces. So it's hard to say as a blanket, blanketed statement, oh, yeah, well, you know, yeah, everyone thinks their way into wherever they are. And everyone mm. is, you know, uh, their, their life is a, a total sum of everything they've ever thought. Well, what about the child who is born with some debilitating sickness or some deformity or some handicap? Mm -hmm. They thought themselves in the womb to come out mangled or diseased? You know, so I don't know. Um, I have a nephew who's autistic and I mean, we've prayed over him. We have fasted over him. We've done every spiritual discipline over him ever since he was born. And 
to no avail. Mm. You know, I mean, do I say to him who who can't, you know, work in a cognitive state, Kyron, you need to think your way out of this. Kyron, you need to, you know, formulate an imagination that you don't see yourself this way. Hey, can I tell him that? And he's going to say, oh, okay, Uncle Kyle. I mean, <laughs> you and I have never talked this way before, but I'm going to go right now, sit down and start meditating on me being okay and let that process take its place until I'm okay. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's part of that unknown and those, those questions that keep, you know, that keep coming. I, I think I, I'm starting to understand a little bit of it, but by far, I don't understand a whole lot of yeah. it. Because this is my concern is it becomes a, a new type of privilege, a new type of position right. where, um, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm sure me and you've had very different lives. We've got different backgrounds. We've got different uh, benefits and 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 suck fests as, as well, you know. Um, yeah. But like, you know, and I can look at my neighbors. I can go like 100 miles in every direction. And for the most part, whilst all that goes up and down in the grand scheme of things, we're all very lucky to be in, in my part of the world, in, in Europe, in England, you know, we got a lot of going for us just being in that country. Yeah. Um, and, but then I can go, oh, actually there's two doors down. There's a kid with a debilitating disease, uh, a, a disability. And, and then it's, it's, uh, yeah, very, very bad. Um, or I can, um, you know, probably not go very far. It's been sunny here recently. So we've been in the garden and, uh, it's it's corona time right i mean it's we've got, we've got pandemic going on so i can hear some domestic abuse you know we live in a very poor kind of quite a, a rough place i can hear domestic abuse so i don't have to go far before i go okay so we're all on a similar playing field but actually when we get down to it, it's very different now yeah it's really easy for me in my place i get to sit around and think all day it's basically my job i get to like skype with you you know i mean i can read and study i can talk with people and help them in different ways online but generally speaking my position is i get to sit around and think and explore ideas in this and so in a sense i am immediately put in an upper echelon of society of people that get to explore even what consciousness is because the grand right. scale of people they don't have time right. for this right they're just busy right. doing their yeah, jobs yeah. and with this, right. this. Exactly. and then you go exactly. okay well what about the person that's like in our society that's you know disabled or abuse or poor and suffering and they just don't have the opportunities but then you go even further you go into societies where they don't have access to education you know i mean like right. the clean water i mean like it, it, it's it's this thing of like well that's beautiful that you and me can have this very amazing enlightened conversation of like this opportunity and i think right. it's true i think there's truth in all of this and i'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's not but right. i do think there's almost this danger of, of uh, for me it comes back down to if it doesn't work for the least of these right it can't exactly. it, it's not it, i can't stop here and, and right. I'm not accusing you of, of that either, because right. I hear in your language, yeah, I, I can't stop right. here. So it's, it's right. the thing of like, I'm not sure how it works for least of these, right? but it is working. So right. how do we wrestle with that? I think this, it, I just think it's a real, um, I, and I'm not expecting to have the answer. See that I have to throw yeah. this yeah, no, 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 problem really on your plate. Um, yeah, really but yeah, don't. I do think it's, it's a danger that we become this new, it's almost like a spiritual position of, of Right. Uh, privilege right. and, and I, the last thing i want it to be is any sort of um opportunity for me to sit on a high tower and look down and go oh look at these people they're just not as you know developed oh, they're just there like in their evangelical christian or oh, look at this person they're a whatever you know the, they're an indigenous uh, tribe doing mystical right. engagement with deer or trees and worshiping trees oh, look at them they're so unenlightened or maybe i think they're more enlightened i don't know right. um, but you know like but i think it can it can just become this new opportunity for privilege and inclusive uh, exclusivity yeah. almost um right it can potentially yeah um so yeah. yeah i i don't know how we go about making s some of these realities accessible to some of the least um able to to do this easily day in day out or is it part of a thing of like well you know what me 200 years ago i wouldn't have been able to be here and i just you know that's just the path my yeah. family the, the, my culture we've gone on a journey yeah. and other people are still on that journey and you know what that area of the world that situation it's it's a variation but on the grand scheme of things it is going to get better it's going to get more and more able to tap yeah. into the consciousness I, I that's how i kind of deal with it in a lot of ways um, yeah. But again, if we look at God in a sense of, if we, as soon as we personify God, 
there's this element of morality and ethics that yeah. we feel very uncomfortable very uncomfortable yeah. with the god going oh yes. i'm gonna i'm gonna allow this person to be here and right ah, they're gonna be uh systematically abused by their parents yeah and yeah. that's the way it is it's just you know that's how they are and maybe they'll tap in maybe they won't but that's the situation i've kind of dumped them in it's really hard for me to engage yeah, that's, with that concept yeah yeah that is that is really difficult and, and i would I would run from that. I, I well, I do. I now run from that version of a god. Mm. If that's the way it is, uh, you know, I, I I didn't pay a lot of attention to it before, but that's how I thought it was. Yeah. Now, I saw something the other day, and this is starting to really resonate with me a little bit. I don't know how true it is. I think there's probably some truth in it somewhere. Maybe not to this full degree, but uh, Jesse Duplantis, a evangelical preacher here in America. He once said something years ago, I heard him say, hey, you know, the thing is, you know, we, we, we asked to come here. We just forgot when we got here, you know, and he said it in a joking kind of way. Mm, I think I've heard that, this, you yeah. know, yeah, we've, we've been, you know, we've, we've always existed. Um, so our birth didn't happen. when We popped through the canal and, wah, you know, we've always existed. We've always been pure life. And we, we chose, we wanted to come here. We wanted to come here to have this experience. But the, the trade-off would be we would forget and we'd have to relearn and we mm. discover who we are. Now, I don't understand that if it's the case. Cause that makes no sense to me. But anyway, and I recently Jesse saw- Jesse DePlantis is out there, man. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love people that are like, here's, and, and just so factually, like, you know, it's like, oh yeah, we chose to be like, this is something, it's like, yeah, this, yeah, guy, you know, this guy know. knows this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I like, I like those kind of ideas. <laughs> Because it sparks a fascinating thought experiment, yeah, right? So, it does. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> and, and so I saw, and I've, I've heard stuff like this through the years, and more so mm-hmm. lately than, than not, because I've been, you know, so fascinated with all this other stuff that I'm now learning. And I saw something the other day. It's really fascinating. It's it's two young girls, two little girls talking, and they're this, they're this part of consciousness, and they're like agents, and they're talking about this this intelligence looking for volunteers out in the in the entirety of the cosmos and they want these volunteers to come to earth to kind of help us kind of awaken to who we are so to speak but what they said as they're dialoguing between one another because one's kind of asking questions to the one agent who came and this other agent is thinking about going so you know, she's asking the, the other agent questions and she goes but you know, we 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 go there, but we forget everything, and 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 they're even talking about having chosen to come, and and I I saw something else that says not only did we choose to come, but we chose what our experiences would be, like we wrote it out. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to be born black, you know, in an inner city uh, with with an alcoholic father and a you know a, a church bound mother, and I want to you know marry at this age and i want to die this way and th- and this person this is not that one video this is a separate one but this person is talking about this in such a matter of fact and kind of way that and she's gone there and she's seen this these contracts being written out she's seen it and she's talking about it in a very matter of fact ma- matter of mm. factly kind of way her name is helen i don't remember the last name and she, and it, it was, it's it's somewhat fascinating to think that's possible because someone from the audience said, well, what about people who die in train wrecks and things like that? And I said, listen, believe it or not, but they chose that. They wanted to know what the experience is like to mm. die in a train wreck. Uh, but, you know, and she also suggests that, you know, we just keep coming back and writing a new contract and going back and trying to get, you know, kind of thing. And I've heard people talk about It's like a weird like game that. of Westworld, right? Have you seen Westworld? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah just right? like, so you just go like, in you and know, you're like, I'm going to be a gunslinger i want to like right. hook up with this girl or guy and i want to like right. go on this type of adventure where i catch a bad guy or i don't mind if i get shot and like die because i know i'm not yeah. gonna die i'm just gonna yeah exactly. go home after my weekend experience it, yeah. dude this is quite like um the, the, the thought experiment of the egg uh, which is sandy weirdest thing of, mm-hmm. but that we're all this singular consciousness so in a yeah. sense we we this this uh god uh it go it, decides to experience every single human experience so right every right. single life is god going oh i'm gonna now be kyle butler and just see what it's yeah. like let's see let's yeah. live that out and oh but i'm also I'm, and i'm gonna live as um someone who is 
uh, abused by their partner, but I'm also going to be the partner that abuses them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be, and not to mention the lives that have come before that, that made them who they are, right? So the person who's the abuser, I'm going to go through that childhood that they had that would bring them to a place where they would abuse someone they loved, right? Um, And Mm -hmm. But it's the thing of like, yeah, I'm going to be someone that dies in a train wreck, but I'm also going to be someone that falls asleep at the the wheel of the train and then has to live with it or, you know, whatever. And and, and it's literally every possible experience being experienced. It's right. a fascinating thought experiment. It I, is. Because the thing is, is right, really. this is what Christians get obsessed with. Like, oh, well, you can't say that. You can't say this. You can't say that. You can't say this. You know. But the thing is, we just have no freaking idea. Wait, 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 we're we're we don't. so obsessed with, uh, it. well, this is exactly what it is. But right. the Bible doesn't lay out what is. And neither no. does uh, no, we're neither close. Does even early Christian tradition. Do we go, oh, this yeah. is exactly what is, is. And this is what the afterlife looks like. And this is, we don't know. We just don't. No clue. Um, no clue. And, and in a sense, we don't even know who we are. I mean, that's what a good chunk of the right. Bible is exploring. Well, what the heck are we? Like, why are we here? Right. And what to what end? Yeah. And what is mm-hmm. this God that mm-hmm. we're desperately trying to engage with? Um, right. And so I love looking at these things and exploring these things. It's fascinating. You'll have to, um, if you can find what that was, if you could send it to me, I'm really interested. I will. I will. I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you both because I, I, I have it in my YouTube save. So I'll send you okay, both. Okay, perfect. Um, and one is a lady kind of lecturing and it's, it's rather long, but she, you know, she says some of these kind of things. And then the, the, the one with the two ages is a short, like six minute clip or something like that. But these things I've heard from time to time, I, I rejected them mostly before in my religiously indoctrinated mindset. But now to me today, these things are fascinating. Yeah. And I would, I would embrace this more if this were the way it is, because then it absolves this God, figure this God being as having any real part to play in how all this stuff is really playing out. Mm-hmm. You know, if we're there and we're, Hey, you know what, uh, you know, we're talking to the, you know, this, this, this consciousness and we're of course part of it, but we're saying, okay, 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 okay. N- now let me go and, and do this and let me go be this and whatever, whatever. Um, I, I would, I would, I wouldn't mind that possibility mm-hmm. as it were. And and even though in my in my my logical thinking right now, I can't imagine why someone would want to come and live the life I lived. Like, why would yeah. you choose that? I mean, why not choose this? I mean, you right, know, yeah, yeah. You on TV and go that life right yeah. there. <laughs> you know, Instagram, you yeah, that person. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, what were you thinking? You know, it's been pretty hard through most of yeah. this journey. This was the best you could dream up, really. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this contract. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's really funny. I think there's a beauty in it of um, uh, this. Is, to me, it comes back to uh, so again the idea of the egg of, of at least um, this singular consciousness ex- experiencing all this. It comes back to this concept of Christ, the co-suffering servant. That, that, yeah. that, that, that there's, I think we are very um, dualistic in the sense of how we see ourselves and God as these two entities, and actually. Right. Um, when we start to see that that is probably less of a reality and it's much more that Christ is within, that Christ is ex- experiencing yeah. everything with us and then going through everything right. with us. Right. Um, it becomes very hard to demonize God in a sense when you go, right. you know, when it's um, God, why would you let that homeless man starve on the street? And you go, Oh wait, no, God is that homeless man starving on the street. That's what Jesus right. says, right? That when you walk past yep. that person starving on the street, right. that was God. Yep. And, and so yep. it's actually, it's less of a finger point of like, God, how dare you? It suddenly becomes right. a thing of like, oh, this is all God working and doing and, and, and right. being. And the bigger question is not God, how dare you let that happen? Because God is in that person and, and mm-hmm. it is that person experiencing that. The yep. question is, what will the God within me do about it? Because right. actually that right. person doesn't have to suffer as much right or right. that disabled person that's got that lot in their life it's not god how could you let that person be born disabled it's a god right. what will you do in me that right. changes that that maybe he comes up with some right. sort of medical breakthrough or technological breakthrough, right. Or, right. or even just practically make sure that their mom yeah. and dads have the resources right. they need to care for this person right. uh, it, right. it, it becomes an inner issue rather than an external yes. issue if that makes sense right and right. i think that's right. yeah absolutely the beauty of this is it allows something to right. that so often is like, why would God do this? We're fixated on the, the problem of right. evil and the problem of suffering. And it's like actually suffering and evil 
um, are two blights that run through humanity. They're not this external element. And not only that, they're two blights that humanity in itself can make better, right? Mm -hmm. I can alleviate suffering and I can make the world a little less evil if only right. just by helping a few people around me and being less of a dick, right? right. I've immediately sure, sure. alleviated suffering and, be and myself become a little less creating of evil in this world. Yeah, um, yep. And I think yeah. that's, a, that's a beautiful outcome that comes from this. Uh, like, mm -hmm. again, the, the idea that we all are um, part of this individual consciousness, it becomes really hard for me to be mean to you, Carl, because I am yeah. you in a sense, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. that's what I love about that yep. concept of oneness. It's like, it's not just right. that right. we have something within us that's similar. It's like, no, no, no. In, there's, a, there's another reality of me that right. it's not just fill this label that I've given myself in this life, but it's actually that mm -hmm. thing that observes all that. Mm -hmm. That also is observing Kyle right now, experiencing Kyle. Right. Yeah. And that that's that's this one entity that's being this experience. Like yeah. it's very hard, right? It's really hard for me to then think, oh, I don't like uh, people of this race. Oh, I don't like people from right. that neighborhood. Oh, right. I don't like people yeah. from that country. Oh, I don't like people that right. vote that way because they're me in another example in another experience i was born in that country in that neighborhood and i had those types of parents or my brother experienced that kind of thing and it caused me to be that person that would be me i, I would be yeah. that person right you're born in baghdad and your parents got bombed to crap in the gulf war no wonder you're absolutely anti-america and anti you know christianity yeah, yeah me too if i went through that experience me yeah. too i would be too sure um, sure yeah, I just think this is a beautiful um, way to engage, at least intellectually yeah. and philosophically. Right, um, right. And I think the danger is it doesn't become a practical, how do we make it hit the road? Because um, yeah. I'm guilty of that. I love to just sit in books and ideas all day and all along. <laughs> and I'll tell people yeah. all amazing ideas, but they're like, yeah, but how does this actually work? Uh, yeah. There is the danger of that, I guess. But no, yeah. it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. It is. And I think too, you know, so much of what you're saying, you know, I can see how you take what you just said, which, <clears throat> you know, is, is God experiencing the billionaire, right? And if this billionaire becomes consciously aware of his God or the God in him, which is the love for his neighbor as he loves himself mm. aspect and this billionaire now has the ability to dramatically change lives of a lot yeah. of people by Jesus. just being the, the the love source that he is towards these people rather than than hoarding it away you know storing up your treasures so to speak where the moth and the the mm -hmm. you know the, the can, can access it and destroy it so to speak but you know really doing it i i was in um mexico last year and um, <clears throat> and I was crossing the border. We were walking across the border. And when you walk across this one bridge, you can, there's little cracks in the railings and you can look down and you see people down there asking you to throw down money. I mean, it, it, wow. my God, it's it, the, the, I mean, I was so like, wow. Now, you know, they're, they're Mexican. We're American, so our dollar has more value. So you drop down a quarter, a dollar. I mean, and, and these people are like, oh my God. And I thought to myself, I need to be in a position in life where I can walk back through this bridge one day and hand out $100 bills or whatever to everyone I see down there mm. or everyone I see asking for help. Now, maybe this won't change their life. It'll definitely change their day, maybe their week, mm -hmm. maybe their month. And what if we all thought that way? Maybe I can't change someone's life totally, but every day I can help change someone's day for the better. Yeah. Right. And 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 again, that's part of that collective consciousness that wants to do good. So I think, you know, I I don't know if it's just a lack of of an awareness to it. Because perhaps if that is the case, and if we really became aware of it, then maybe, maybe that there, there goes evil, right? There yeah. goes poverty. There goes, 
because I don't think lack is real. I don't think lack exists in the universe, in the in the in consciousness, and in, in this divinity. I don't think lack is real. I think lack is a perception of what we think is not there. I don't think there's nothing that doesn't exist in abundance. Mm. Um, so, but you you know you 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 said it multiple times, and we we both referenced it. it. It really goes back to seeing one another as the God, you know. And there's some gods we want to gravitate towards the the famous gods, you know, the Jay Zs and the Beyonces and the you know mm-hmm. the, the 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 royal the, the royal family, whoever. There, there's some god. Oh yeah, I want to be next to you. I want to help you. I want to you know show you my my whatever. But then there's those other gods. We're like, hey, I don't got time for that, you know. And I I I was once there. I I mm-hmm. I, I I once looked upon pan handlers in my town with disgust. You know, and you you would anger me when you asked me for change, and I give it to you sometimes, but most of the time I'd be angered. You know, and why mm. don't you get a job? I'd be thinking, why don't you go to school, you stupid idiot? I'd be thinking, and, and that was a terrible portion of my life. And one day, when I again, I I now embrace oneness, and I see this person as I'm seen, and I and I know this person as I'm known, and I love this person now as I know that I'm loved. And, and maybe I can't change your life, but I'm going through a drive through of McDonald's one day and I see this man and I know he's about to ask me for money because that's what they do when they're standing outside of the drive through in, in McDonald's. And um, I look upon him and I immediately know this. This man does not deserve for me to treat him in an ill way. He's not looking for that. And that was, again, one of those moments where I realized that I had a responsibility and opportunity right now to treat this person as a highly beloved person, just as I am, with respect and love and honor where he's at. And I I choose to do that now. It's a conscious decision of mine now to treat people that way. But I wasn't always there. And I didn't get more saved. I didn't get more holy. I didn't get more <laughs> baptized in the Holy Ghost or anything like that. I just became aware of this love inside of me that desires to reach out and touch people around me. It's beautiful, Carl. Really, really beautiful. We should probably wind up. So, I mean, it's been amazing. I feel like we could have gone on forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I look at my clock and I'm like, oh, we really should probably wind up. Yeah. But, uh, oh, we've, yeah. been, we've been going. Um, but yeah. I'm like, dude, we could go on forever about stuff like this. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Um, it is very fascinating. For, for people that do want to kind of keep the conversation going and, and, and keep following your train of thought, um, how can they engage with you? Where where are you publicly, online? Um, uh, mostly Facebook. Okay. And, um, you know, mostly on Facebook and I do have a website and it's, it's, um, what is, oh, <laughs> kylelbutler.com. Okay. And on that website, it'll give you the links to all of my stuff, my, you know, my Facebook and uh, my um, YouTube and Twitter and everything like that. I use Facebook mostly. So, you know, most of the videos and postings and things like that'll be all on Facebook. Um, I do have a YouTube channel but it's it's limited stuff they haven't uploaded my stuff there so if you go to my website website kyle butler kyle, kyle l butler dot com it'll take you give you links to get to my personal pages and then you can friend me there or inbox awesome. and we can talk more things like that I'll, I'll put that link in the show notes so people can just click that and, and be good to go um but yeah dude this has been really great and uh and yeah, we, should, we should stay in touch anyway so we'll, we'll absolutely uh, i look forward we'll, to that we'll do it again and explore a whole nother you need to let me know once you figured out the answers to you know the great problem and anything else and <laughs> problem <laughs> suffering and evil and <laughs> yeah yeah well, right right now i'm 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 cemented on you know it's the love in me that's going to make it better yeah. for the next person next to me yeah or the person next to me. Yeah. You know, if we all worked out of that, and we can, mm-hmm. you know, um, and there's there's nothing there's nothing really stopping us from doing it. Again, yeah. I, maybe maybe I can't cure my nephew's autism, but uh, maybe there's something I can do to, to 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 aid his life to make it easier until something comes along that can. 
Yeah. And, you know, of course, that's easy for me to do because he's my nephew. Mm -hmm. And I need to not only know that it's easy for me to do because it's my nephew, but the person I see outside of my family and friends and circles. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to be able to, to look inside of me and say, what can I do to extend love to this person to make them feel valued? And that's what I try to do in my posts, my videos. I want people to, to, to know love and feel love and understand their value. And I think once we get that settled, then the rest of it starts to make sense or we start to figure it out yeah. as we go along. Yeah. Have you heard of, um, uh, do you remember, I think it was in the seventies, a guy called Timothy Leary. He was like really big into like LSD and stuff. Like that. He had this theory. He, he wanted to like dose all of America's water with LSD um, because he had this theory that when you take LSD, you feel one with everyone and everything. And so like, if we can just get all Americans everywhere, you know, to be drinking their water or having a bath and just be like, basically trip out on LSD, they'd suddenly see we're all one. And then mm. every problem would be solved. Now, Put to the side, maybe some of his methodology, but yeah. I, but I think but I think that's what we're hitting on here is this element of if yeah. if if you can see everyone else around you as 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 the, when you love them you're loving God when the, the, yeah. right in front of you is God and and within you is God you, you are able to love everyone and anything and everything around you um, and if there was an awakening of that now I can't get anyone else to think like that. Hopefully things like this podcast help people explore ideas like that. Yeah. But generally speaking, I can't do that, right? The only thing I can do is do it myself. Um, sure. And so I think like um, as whack as whack as his theory was, and maybe his methodology, um, I think that's what this world needs. I think it does need um, yeah. people to see everyone else as really, this is an extension of who I am. This is, this is a piece of God. This is, this is, this is me looking into the heart of God. When I look at this person, when I look into their eyes, I see into the eyes of God. You know, you think of like, you, you talk about the billionaire. Like, I mean, if, if you had um, Jeff Bezos has an awakening, realizes every person right. at Amazon fulfillment factory, or, you know, every, right. every person he employs, right. he's, he, when he pays them this way, or when he gives them right. this many hours, or right. when he puts them in that situation, this what he's doing to, to, to God, uh, right. you know, Right. What would it do? You know, where because it's easy to demonize someone like that. You know, it's very easy to demonize the rich and the wealthy. Um, sure. Because we we all hate those people because we're not those people. <laughs> right. um, yeah, we but, hate we hate them until. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, but like, what what an amazing difference it would make? Because I tell you what, I, I I hope that I can make a big difference, but I don't have the opportunity of having you know however many a hundred thousand people employed or you know <laughs> that's a right, whole other right. level. You could change lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's this thing of like just greater awareness of of we're mm -hmm. all in this together we're all part of yeah. something bigger than ourselves and that we're not yeah. us them it's just us um right that's a right. beautiful beautiful right thing. Uh, it is and it what is. an amazing you're 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 living it out you can you can see it in in the way that you communicate in the way that you see life uh, it's a beautiful thing to see and so uh thank you for what you're doing with that and uh yeah thank you. Looking forward to uh, getting to know you more and, and staying in touch for sure. All right, my man. I love you, bro. Right. Thank you. Catch okay. you later, man. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye.